Folks, we're going to get started. Let me just give folks another 30 seconds. Okay, uh, sorry we're running uh, two minutes late, but uh, hopefully we can make up some of the time during the break. Uh, so good morning, my name is Bonnie Lin. I'm the director of the China Power Project and senior fellow for Asian security at CSIS. I'm very delighted to welcome you to this eighth uh, conf China Power Conference. It's actually our first full, fully a one day in person China Power Conference that we've had since COVID. So we're very delighted that we have an excellent lineup of speakers as well as prominent experts to discuss five different debate topics, all relevant to uh, China's defense as well as China's foreign policy. Uh, what makes this China Power Conference different from other conferences are two aspects. First is instead of panels in which experts are broadly talking about a subject area, we actually have debates. So we've asked 10 leading experts to take different positions on critical topics that are central to the China debate. The second aspect that makes our conference different is that we actually pull the audience and get your views and your participation on these critical topics. So I hope for those of you both in here, here in person as well as online that you can participate in the polls as we're going through each of the debates. But perhaps um, the most important part of the conference is early on the day when we actually have a, a keynote practitioner, a senior official from the Biden administration join us. He probably needs no introduction, but I still should. Uh, we are very well delighted that we can have Dr. Eli Ratner, Assistant Secretary of Defense, uh, with us today. He is Assistant Se Secretary of Defense for Indo-Pacific Affairs. In that position, he served as the Principal Advisor for the Under Secretary of Defense for Policy and the Secretary of Defense on International Security Strategy and Policy on issues of DOD interests that relate to the Indo-Pacific region. Prior to confirmation, he served as the Director of the DOD China Task Force and a Senior Advisor for China to the Secretary of Defense. Before arriving at DOD, Dr. Ratner was the Executive Vice President and Director of Studies at the Center for New American Security, where he was a member of the executive team and responsible for managing the center's agenda and staff. Prior to that, he served from 2015 to 2017 as the Deputy National Security Advisor to then Vice President Joe Biden. From 2011 to 2012, he was in the Office of the Chinese and Mongolia Affairs at this Department of State. Uh, so after Dr. Ratner makes his remarks, we will have a short discussion and, and then open uh, to Q&A from both the audience in person as well as online. So Eli, thank you again for joining us and please, uh, please come up here for the podium. So I think you are wired, but I think this is probably going to be slightly better. Okay, well, uh, good morning, everyone, and uh, thank you, Bonnie, for that uh, very kind introduction. It's great to see so many familiar faces uh, around the room, at, uh, especially for such an important event and one that I have uh, participated in the past. Uh, places like CSIS, gatherings like this, play a really important role in, in fostering rich conversations about the relationship between the United States and the PRC, and I have no doubt that uh, today will be any different. Um, and I would say as a recovering uh, scholar and think tank expert myself, I can really attest uh, to the immense value that these debates and discussions have had over the years. Uh, and it's, it's the, your work that continues to really provide important insights for officials across the Defense Department and the U.S. government, uh, myself included. So. Uh, thank you all again for being here today. Um, now I know uh, Bonnie has planned a great agenda for you all uh, with some really excellent debates, really critical topics. I wish I could actually spend 
uh, the full day here because there's going to be some terrific discussions. Um, but I did want to take just a few minutes this morning to share with you uh, the Department of Defense's perspective on the PRC's military power as it stands in 2023. Uh, and just as importantly, what we're doing at the Pentagon and, and in the U.S. government to set the pace as we rise to the China challenge. Um, as many of you know, uh, every year for over 20 years, the department has released what we call the China Military Power Report. DASD Chase is here today. His team uh, leads that effort uh, at the Pentagon, uh, which uh, we, uh, is sometimes known as shorthand as CMPR. Um, Congress first required this annual report from the department uh, in the National Defense Authorization Act for fiscal year 2000. Uh, and it's, it's really a critical example of longstanding bipartisan interests and concern about the PLA's capabilities. Um, needless, needless to say, it's an important document because it is the department's authoritative public assessment of the PLA and, and the role it plays in helping realize Beijing's broader ambitions. This year's report uh, will be out soon, very soon. Uh, you can bug Mike about exactly when that will be uh, later in the day. Um, but the report will underscore the department's fundamental assessment, which is that China's leaders are increasingly turning to the PLA as an instrument of coercion in support of their revisionist aims. You've heard from this administration often that the PRC is the only country in the world with the will and increasingly the capability to refashion the international order in ways that would deeply undermine vital U.S. interests and global peace and stability. And the forthcoming uh, CMPR will show why this assessment continues to be the case. It will also show why the 2022 National Defense Strategy identified the PRC as the department's pacing challenge. And here I have to note that by prioritizing the PRC as DOD's top pacing challenge, the strategy we released to the public nearly one year ago marked the very first of its kind. And the bottom line is this. We are clear-eyed about the challenges posed by the PLA's growing capabilities and by how it is choosing to use these capabilities in threatening and destabilizing ways. For example, we have seen PLA aircraft and maritime vessels continue to engage in coercive and risky behavior against U.S. ally and partner forces operating in accordance with international law. This is happening in the Taiwan Strait and in the East and the South China Seas and beyond. This includes PLA activities in the air and at sea that increase the likelihood of an accident that could spiral into crisis or conflict. We have also seen the PRC continue its rapid expansion, modernization, and diversification of its nuclear forces, all encased in a lack of transparency that extends further to domains such as space and cyber. And we have seen the PRC demonstrate a concerning lack of interest in maintaining open lines of military-to-military -military communication where our defense and military officials could discuss their concerns about these activities and others like them. And as you all know, the PRC has declined multiple invitations for, from the department for opportunities to communicate directly with Secretary Austin, the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, and other department officials. And we will continue to call, we will continue to call for substantive conversations between our senior most defense officials. But at the same time, we know this. Conflict in the Indo-Pacific region is neither imminent nor inevitable because deterrence is real and strong today. And we're doing more than ever together with our allies and partners to keep it that way by advancing a common vision for regional peace and stability. And I'd like to spend the remainder of my time with you this morning sharing more about what we have been able to deliver together in just the past 12 months. First, we're investing in critical capabilities at the Department of Defense to maintain deterrence in this decade and beyond. As you heard from senior leaders across the department, the president's budget request for fiscal year 2024 was the most strategy aligned budget in our history. These investments will strengthen our warfighting advantages, exploit adversary vulnerabilities, and address critical operational challenges in the Indo-Pacific. They provide capabilities that will strengthen our combat credible deterrent by ensuring we can prevail in conflict. Our budget request also sought unprecedented levels of funding for research and development. 
In other words, this is the largest R&D budget ever requested by the Department of Defense. And these major investments will help us develop and deploy breakthrough technologies to deter conflict in the decades ahead. Second, we're deepening our alliances and partnerships across the region. And in almost every single instance, these alliances and partnerships now run deeper than they ever have. This is one of America's greatest strategic advantages, and it's growing even stronger. The department is supporting our Indo-Pacific friends as they invest in their own strength, in their relationships with each other, and in their relationships with us. For example, we're supporting Japan's efforts to acquire new counter-strike capabilities, which you may have heard more about yesterday following Secretary Austin's uh, bilateral meeting with his new Japanese counterpart, uh, Minister Kihara. We've launched a major new technology initiative with India with strong support from the White House, and we're working with countries across Southeast Asia to acquire asymmetric capabilities to counter Beijing's coercive activities. Consistent with longstanding U.S. policy, we are also supporting Taiwan's self-defense in the face of, of the PRC's aggressive threats and ongoing pressure campaign. Finally, we're bringing together our historic capability investments and our momentum with allies and partners to deliver a U.S. force posture in the region that is more mobile, distributed, resilient, and lethal. With Australia, we're increasing rotations of U.S. bombers and fighters through Australian bases while deepening our logistics cooperation. With Japan, we have agreed to station the Marine Corps' most advanced formation forward for the first time ever in 2025. With the Philippines, U.S. forces will now have access to four new strategic locations across the country as part of our important Enhanced Defense Cooperation Agreement. And with Papua New Guinea, where Secretary Austin made history as the first U.S. Secretary of Defense to ever visit the country, we recently concluded a defense cooperation agreement that will deepen our bilateral security cooperation. Now, each of these achievements could have been considered the highlight of an entire year or even an entire term for our forward presence in the Indo-Pacific. But through relentless work by the President, the Secretary of Defense, and our colleagues across the administration, we have advanced all of them together and in just the past 12 months. So let me conclude by saying, consistent with the theme of the conference today, of course the PLA's power matters, but so does our power, and so does the collective power of our allies and partners. Continuing to deliver in the Indo-Pacific will require considerable attention, resources, and prioritization by the U.S. government, and we are focused on doing what it takes. So thank you again for the opportunity to be here today. Thank you, Bonnie, uh, and I look forward to the discussion. Thank you very much, Eli. I think there was a lot that you covered. Unfortunately, we won't have time to really unpack everything. But I did want to follow up with one issue that you mentioned at the very top, which is that you're seeing that the PLA is, in, sorry, that China is increasingly turning to the PLA as an instrument of coercion. Are you seeing that uh, China is using military more compared to other tools of coercion, whether those are diplomatic or economic tools? Yeah, no, it, it, it's a good question. And uh, I think uh, the, the point in, in the remarks is that, look, uh, if you went back five, ten years ago, Bonnie, you've been, you've been following this for decades, uh, it was the case that there was a perception that, yes, the PLA was modernizing, but that Beijing was using its military tool uh, very much in the background, that it was not, that it was dip diplomatically driven, economically driven in terms of how it was trying to achieve its foreign policy aims. And what the China military uh, report, power report uh, is putting forward, what it noted last year, but uh, increasingly notes this year is that isn't the case anymore, that the PLA is just in the background, that it is now in the forefront of the way that Beijing is going about trying to achieve its revisionist aims in the East China Sea, uh, the Taiwan Strait, the South China Sea, border with India and beyond. And I think that's a, a, it's a significant change in PLA strategy. So it's not just the large, it's not just us worrying about the large scale contingencies, but on the day to day gray zone pressure has been increasing. Absolutely. And, and I think uh, several of our allies and partners who are on the front lines of that would attest to that. 
Uh, the other question I had with both you and Mike here is I did want to ask about, from your perspective, where is the state of U.S.-China military-to-military relations, particularly with the uh, removal of China's defense minister, Li Shangfu? Are you more optimistic that we will be able to communicate or have more channels with the Chinese on the military side soon? Well, to your first question of uh, where are we today, we are not where we need to be and not where we should be. Um, uh, mill mill communications between the Defense Department and, and counterparts uh, in Beijing have been uh, largely turned off over the last year. There have been episodic interactions. Uh, Secretary Austin did meet with uh, his defense, the PRC Defense Minister in Cambodia last November on the margins of the ADMM Plus, the ASEAN Defense Minister's meeting. That was the last time he had a direct interaction uh, with the PLA. And in the interim, as I noted, uh, the chairman, others, Admiral Aquilino, have tried to reach out to counterparts uh, unsuccessfully. We have seen uh, some new openings. I've had the opportunity to meet with the ambassador here in Washington. Admiral Aquilino had to, an opportunity to meet with a senior P PLA official uh, on the margins. Um, but as it relates to our um, the dialogues that we have built, both at the political military level as well, at the, as well as at the operational level, those are not back up and running yet. Um, and so uh, we don't think the uh, fits and starts that have happened yet are a substitute for sustained dialogue and sustained communication uh, between our leaders. I would say from the perspective of the United States, our position has been 100% consistent since the absolute, uh, for sure, since Secretary Austin walked into this role, which is he has said repeatedly that we are seeking open lines of communication with the PLA. We think that's important, even as the relationship grows uh, more competitive, and that is true today. And the United States has had and will keep an outstretched hand to the PLA, and, and your question about what comes next ought to be directed toward them, and I think we may have some representatives from the PRC Embassy here today, so maybe they can shed some light on that. But we absolutely uh, look forward to uh, uh, opportunities for our senior leaders to engage if those present themselves. We'll, we'll ask the representative from the PLA, uh, from the, sorry, the Chinese embassy at a later time. Yep. We're not on stage. Yeah. But uh, yeah, I did want to follow up on that question to look and relate to some of the debates that we have. So one of, one of the first debate that we'll have next is about managing crises and tensions uh, in U.S.-China relations. Uh, looking at it from the military side, are you, um, what do you see that we're most lacking right now in terms of what we need to do, whether that's more communication channels with the PLA in terms of how we can have a better handle if we were to get into a crisis or incident, uh, whether that's in the South China Sea or the Taiwan Strait, what do we need to be able to manage that vis-a-vis uh, -vis the PLA or vis-a-vis -vis the Chinese government as a whole? Well, look, I think we've had some good diplomatic engagement over the uh, last couple months, and, and that can support the management of some of these tensions. But again, I don't think... Uh, those are a substitute for direct mm -hmm. communications between military leadership and potentially between military operators. And I think we should remain concerned uh, that in the event of a, a crisis, uh, that we don't have the habits of communication, we don't have the relationships, and we don't have the kinds of open channels we need to be able to manage those uh, in, the, in the tight time frames that, that we would want to. So I think that's really why we think this is so important. And uh, this is about uh, potential crises, but also talking about issues like space and cyber, new domains, China's nuclear modernization, as I mentioned, that also create potential opportunities for escalation that we ought to be talking about. So I think that uh, we are not, uh, again, where we need to be. That remains uh, a priority for us. And I'll just ask one more question. I know there are probably uh, many questions from the audience. There, uh, once we open up for Q&A, there will be a rotating microphone, so you don't need to line up anywhere. But the final question, Eli, have for you relates to Taiwan. Uh, that's been quite a bit of, of a focus, uh, both for your team as well as Mike's team. But as you look at Taiwan, today we have two debates related on Taiwan, both in terms of when Xi Jinping has signaled, if he has, a timeline for unification with Taiwan, as well as another debate on whether it's more or less likely that China would think about using a uh, blockade or evading Taiwan. I just wanted to see if you had any, if you wanted to weigh in on any of those debates or share your thoughts on um, where you think Xi Jinping has, what you think Xi Jinping has in mind for Taiwan. Okay. Yes. Ha happy to, uh, and we can we can draw that out some of this in the discussion as well. I think. Uh, Happy to take the question of timelines, because uh, folks pay a lot of attention to this. I think uh, 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 
Director of CIA uh, Burns has noted that Xi Jinping has set timeline, timelines for PLA modernization. That's very different than timelines for uh, aggression. Uh, and uh, our position today is that uh, we believe conflict is neither imminent nor inevitable. We believe deterrence is real and strong. Uh, and we're doing everything we can to keep it that way. We are modernizing our uh, operational concepts uh, through the joint warfighting concept. We are uh, obviously investing in capabilities relevant to uh, operational challenges in the Indo-Pacific. We are strengthening our alliances and partnerships, uh, and we're uh, making our forward presence in the Indo-Pacific more distributed, more resilient, and more lethal. And we think those things together uh, reinforce deterrence and will over time. I was asked uh, alongside uh, Wendy Sherman in a, in a hearing before the Senate Foreign Relations Committee by Senator Rubio, just a few seconds left, so we didn't get to build on the question, but the question was, do you think there's any chance we make it to the end of the decade without uh, the PRC invading Taiwan? And my answer was yes, and then uh, the time ran out, so I didn't get to give the full answer, though I, I gave most of the full answer just now, but the answer is yes, it's gonna take a lot of hard work, it's gonna take focus, it's gonna take attention and resources, but uh, I do think if we uh, are vigilant that we can continue to uh, reinforce and sustain deterrence into the future, and, and again, we believe that is uh, the state of the, the, of the situation today. So um, that's what I would say about that. And then um, on the blockade question, look, I think the, I was asked about this again, different, different hearing uh, before the House Armed Services Committee recently. There's a lot of talk about uh, various gray zone contingencies, uh, potential uh, contingencies below the threshold of armed conflict. Um, a lot of talk about blockade in particular. Mm -hmm. uh, we are very mindful of this. We are looking at this very closely inside the department. Um, just a couple points here, one, what happens the very minute that the PRC starts mounting a blockade against Taiwan? The global economy falls through the floor. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that's the first thing that's gonna happen, not just for China, not just for Taiwan, for the United States, for Japan, for Southeast Asia, mm -hmm. for India, for Africa, for Latin America, for Europe. Uh, there will be no one immune from the economic pain that the PRC would place on the world through doing that. And, um, I would charge those in the audience who work on international economic issues that I think this remains a gap mm -hmm. uh, that the think tank community would be very well positioned to fill to help uh, the broader community understand the economic implications, even just of crisis, not of conflict right. in the Taiwan Strait, because some of the analyses that I've seen are quite extreme in terms of what a blockade-like scenario would do for the global economy on a scale vastly greater than what the world experienced under COVID. So that's the first thing that's going to happen. Mm -hmm. uh, the second thing that's going to happen is that the global community is going to rally around and against the PRC's actions because of what it is doing to the global economy. And Beijing will be inviting exactly the kind of counterbalancing diplomatic coalition that is trying to avoid on this issue. And third, importantly, operationally, and, and maybe uh, folks will get into this later today, and there are different variations, and I understand mm -hmm. that's maybe some of the nuances will be drawn out. Um, blockades are not easy to actually uh, enact, mm -hmm. uh, particularly at the scale around uh, Taiwan. And therefore, uh, we think uh, that Taiwan would still have options on its own and with the international community to deliver the kind of industrial supplies and raw materials, food and energy it would need to sustain mm -hmm. uh, its society, and that ultimately, it would be up to Beijing to decide whether it wanted to start uh, attacking commercial vessels to sustain a blockade. So the risk of escalation is extremely high. So uh, I would say, as it relates to blockade, when I look at that issue, the cost for Beijing looks very high and the risk uh, looks very, very high. Well, thank but let you. me know after the <laughs> panel today. I'll be interested to see what the, how the expert discussion plays out. But that's, that's my view and that's the view of the Pentagon. Thank you very much, Eli. We do have one of the debaters here, Lonnie Henley. So I think um, I will definitely uh, bring up some of those questions in your panel. But um, with that, let me open this up for Q&A from the audience. We should have two floating mics. Uh, one is right there in the back and one on this one. So please raise your hand. We'll take two questions from the room first and then we'll go to questions online. So I see one right here, please. Sorry, they're, they're coming. It's just uh, people are leaving at the same time. 
If you could introduce yourself very briefly and then your question. <clears throat> yeah, thank you. Uh, my name is Liam Cosgrove. Um, <clears throat> um, so my, my question is on deterrence, uh, which, so I understand the argument of, of building Taiwan to be a porcupine, making it too expensive to invade, and then that idea acts as deterrence because China doesn't want to, you know, suffer that cost. Um, my question, though, is, you know, last month we saw the biggest military drill by China in the Pacific Ocean ever. Um, the same argument was true of Ukraine. It was, let's give them weapons, let's do joint military drills with NATO, let's train um, their soldiers since 2014. But eventually it reached a point where, you know, Russia felt that it needed to invade to stop having U.S. influence on its border. Taiwan, obviously, you know, um, what is it, 90, 70 miles off the coast of China. So it seems like these, these actions that are in, in service of deterrence, ostensibly, are actually escalating. And it's, and it's forcing these countries into a position where they feel like they have to respond. Um, and, and whether they're justified in doing that or not, we're, we saw it last month with China's, you know, largest drill ever. So what, what do you say to that criticism? Well, look, it's a good question. Um, and uh, what I would say is a couple things. Number one, uh, the U.S. policy toward Taiwan has not changed. Uh, we oppose uh, unilateral changes uh, by either side. Uh, that We've been crystal clear about that. And we do not support Taiwan independence. And we say that publicly. Uh, we say that privately. Um, sometimes the PRC accuses, of, accuses the United States of supporting uh, Taiwan independence and that uh, nothing could be further from the truth. So um, our efforts are focused on uh, maintaining deterrence uh, and not engaging in the kinds of activities uh, that you're describing that would be a lurch toward uh, an important change uh, in the status quo that could be potentially de destabilizing. So we're focused on trying to get that balance right. My apologies. We probably want to get in some other questions, if, that, if that's okay. okay but just, just real quickly. <laughs> Maybe just hear the comment, and then we can move sure. on if you'd like to. Yeah. We do have, you know, um, what is it? I think like 200. So what, let's get, can we get your, the, the microphone to you? Get one second. Let's okay. give you the microphone. Um, but, so, the, yeah, fair response, but I just mean we have 200 or so troops stationed in Taiwan. We have bases kind of making an arc around China and various other countries like Philippines and Japan. Um, so regardless of whether you support Taiwan independence in name, we, our, our military presence is, you know, very close to China, whereas they have, you know, I, I think one or two artificial island bases. You know, they're not, they're not establishing bases. They are doing the whole you know, Belt and Road stuff, but they don't have military bases in South America or Africa, you know, so, um, I don't know, what do you say to that? Well, no, no, let me, let me, okay. I'm happy to, I'm happy to jump on this, because I think the, uh, does the United States have a robust military presence in the Indo-Pacific? Yes. Uh, why? Because we want to support a free and open Indo-Pacific, we want to maintain the status quo that we believe has been fundamental to the peace and prosperity that uh, has been uh, delivered to that region uh, to the benefit of billions of people. And we want to maintain that. So the intentions matter, right? The intention of the United States is to, to strengthen and support uh, its military position in the region and with its allies and partners to maintain the status quo uh, and to maintain a free and open Indo-Pacific in contrast to the PRC, where we see a leadership setting milestones to develop capabilities to commit aggression. Okay, now we had talked about the intention, and, and we're doing everything we can to ensure the day never comes when it, when it is within a cost calculus worth it uh, to exact that aggression, but the intention here really matters. Uh, and the PRC is seeking military bases around the world. This has also been uh, documented carefully in the China Military Power Report and among a number of experts uh, in the Washington research community and around the world. So uh, PLA is growing its operational reach. Uh, that's something we are mindful of. But the question of what are the intentions around the capability and what is our goal and what is our vision for the Indo-Pacific really matters. And I'll just say one more word on this because I think it's important. If you look back on 
uh, the last couple of speeches, but in particular the speech that Secretary Austin gave at the Shangri-La Dialogue in June in Singapore. I would urge you all to take a look at that. It is the marquee Defense Department speech uh, on the region each year. What he is talking about there is a shared vision for the region. It's not America's vision. It is a shared vision for the region that aligns with the way the Koreans and the Japanese and the Philippines and ASEAN and the Australians and the Indians and even the Europeans are talking about what they want the future to look like in the Indo-Pacific. That's what our military is there to support. And I think that's in contrast to what we see and hear very explicitly from leaders in Beijing about what they want the future of the Indo-Pacific to be. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And I just want to say real quick, I'm totally on board with the vision and, and the intention. Truly? Think, but it's a very delicate situation. You know, you have two I'm sorry, we need, to, we need to Thank stop this conversation. We need Thank to continue you. on with allowing more folks to be able to speak. Okay. Hi, uh, I'm Matthias Hammer from Time Magazine. I have a question regarding DOD's assessment of China's nuclear modernization. I'm wondering what the Pentagon makes of the discrepancy between China's more restrained declaratory policies and its advancing nuclear capabilities, how DOD sees China's specific motivations, or is it seeing any shifts in how PRC sees the role of nuclear weapons in seeking to achieve its foreign policy ambitions underlining the, you know, the expanding nuclear program? Uh, another really good question, uh, and again, coming back to the China Military Power Report, which we're hoping will be out in the coming weeks, we'll be providing uh, the most up-to-date assessment of uh, the PRC's nuclear modernization program. Uh, I think my answer to your question is that we are watching very carefully what is a rapid, unprecedented military buildup of nuclear weapons uh, in China. Um, and we are concerned about the, the uh, lack of transparency about its intentions and how it wants to use those. Um, so again, it's another great question for the PLA and PRC interlocutors, uh, and it's, an, it's the type of issue that we think it would be important to talk about uh, with PLA officials. So it's sort of yet another reason why it would be important for us to have more open lines of communication. Let's take a question from online, and then since we've been talking about Taiwan a bit, I did want to also allow some of our Taiwan colleagues to ask a question, please. Uh, so, on. Uh, so the, the first question on here actually is about Taiwan uh, from our online audience. Okay. Um, so um, one of the viewers uh, asked, you know, how is the department preparing for the Taiwan presidential election in terms of uh, what, uh, you know, how China may escalate uh, or, you know, what the U.S. can do to mitigate risk there? Look, we are, uh, um, the Department of Defense plans, that's what we do. Uh, we are prepared for all contingencies, but uh, we don't see, I would say we look forward to working with uh, whomever takes the reins uh, in Taipei following the election. So, of course, we're keeping an eye on events there. We have seen uh, Beijing use political events in and around Taiwan opportunistically to engage in acts of coercion and aggression, frankly, that they were wanting to do anyway, uh, pulling them off the shelf when they view like they have an excuse to do it. We hope they don't use events around the election to do that, uh, but we'll be prepared for whatever comes. Thank you. Please. Oh, up here. Thanks. Hi, Alexander Huang from Taiwan. Um, you know, in defense business, there are always competing priorities, and, uh, and uh, in different capital, different country, um, usually they make their best assessment and uh, they try to come up with their own uh, modernization program. Uh, I want, uh, based on your assessment and uh, upcoming, you know, China Ministry Power Report, uh, what do you, what's your comment on the competing priorities in Taiwan? Because there are debate that uh, platform-based, you know, conventional systems are still very important because, uh, as people said, in Taiwan, the porcupine uh, could be starved to death. Um, and you have answered some of them in your hearings. Um, what's your comment on the continuing, based on the current you know, threat assessment. What's your comments on the uh, that priorities? Uh, you know, for instance, Taiwan is throw a lot of assets and investment into a submarine program. What's your take? Thank you. Uh, 
Maybe Eli, yep. before you yep. answer this question, we'll, we'll collect the, uh, one more question in the back right there. And then we'll, I think we have about five minutes left. I don't, I just want to give you a little bit of time to decide which one you want, you have time to answer. Uh, Stanley Kober, uh, what lessons do you take from the Vietnam War that apply today? Okay, can you clarify apply today to what? Are, are you talking about Taiwan contingency apply today in terms of? I hear a lot about deterrence. Deterrence failed in Vietnam. Why would it work any better now? Okay. Okay, so. uh, okay. no, it's a good question. Um, let me take the first one. Really important issue about how one thinks about the future of uh, Taiwan's force structure uh, and what, ought, what it ought to look like based on the competing uh, challenges and threats, frankly, that uh, the PRC is presenting uh, to Taiwan on a daily basis because the administration, as you have heard, as I have testified publicly about and you've heard from others, uh, has been focused on ensuring that uh, Taiwan is developing the kinds of asymmetric capabilities it needs to reinforce deterrence. Uh, and again, as we're thinking about um, uh, the need to uh, maintain deterrence against a cross-strait invasion, uh, the types of capabilities that can create operational problems for what would be an incredibly difficult uh, military act by the PLA, even given its relative advantages in size and, and geography and whatnot to commit an amphibious invasion. Taiwan possessing asymmetric capabilities uh, that uh, makes that uh, all the harder. Um, so. That has been a, a, a considerable focus for the United States in terms of our commitments under the Taiwan Relations Act. Um, but absolutely, we have to continue to ensure that Taiwan has the capabilities to counter the coercion it's facing on a daily basis, which has uh, a function all of its own in trying to intimidate and coerce uh, the people on Taiwan. So uh, I think the answer is not that it has to be one or the other. Uh, but that we have to get the balance right. Uh, and uh, I think it is a balance. I think there, there has to be a bias toward asymmetric capabilities given uh, the need uh, to strengthen deterrence into the future. Uh, but that cannot be done in a way that neglects the real, the very real day-to-day -day needs of the Taiwan military. So we take those questions on a case-by-case -case basis, but it really is about uh, getting the balance right with a bias toward uh, asymmetric capabilities. Um, on the question of uh, Vietnam, I guess I would just broaden it out to say, look, um, I did a PhD in political science. I'm sure a number of others, Dr. Lin here as well. Um, uh, we are very thoughtful about how we are thinking about deterrence uh, as it relates to the PRC. We are doing it in as analytical a way as possible. Uh, there are a lot of political scientists inside the Defense Department right now uh, and uh, who are using uh, social scientific methods and others to really try to understand how to get analytical leverage around questions of, of deterrence. So um, history is part of that. Uh, there are case studies in Asia, there are case studies in Europe, and, and we continue to do that in a way that is based on uh, as much analysis and information and history as we can and not just uh, a gut feeling about what deters or what doesn't deter. And, and there has been a major effort uh, inside the department to try to um, come to an increasingly refined and sharper understanding about how we think about deterrence. If you look back on the uh, national defense strategy, integrated deterrence is the central concept uh, in that strategy, um, and preventing this uh, war is our primary focus. So um, we're very focused on the deterrence question, invite uh, analogies from history, but that's broader uh, than any single conflict, and, and uh, we think it's really important, so I appreciate the question. Thank you very much, Eli. Uh, all, all simple questions that you had to answer today. Um, I want to uh, invite everyone to join me in a round of applause for Eli for joining us today. I know you're incredibly busy, so thank you very much.
So we're going to take a 20-minute uh, break while um, Eli, I think, has, to, has, has a very tight schedule and probably has to leave immediately. So thank you, everyone.
Check, check. Check, 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 check. Check, 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 check.
Yep, it works. After COVID, Dan, so I can't believe I totally. It's a weird, it's a weird world. It is a weird world. As I, I meet people for the first time, I know. You know, after meeting everybody for the first time yeah. again. So we're ready to start our uh, first debate of five debate discussions. And the topic of this one, uh, it, the proposition is, the United States and China are making progress in creating a floor, in, in quotations, in US-China relations to manage tensions and crises. Um, of course, Eli touched a little bit on this during his, the Q&A, but this is an uh, increasingly important question given the, um, what we're seeing right now in U.S.-China relations. As you recall, uh, last fall, the meeting between uh, President Biden and uh, President Xi Jinping uh, in Bali, Indonesia, where there was some agreement on, uh, on both sides to find ways to more responsibly manage competition between the United States and China. And since then, we had several incidences, including the uh, surveillance balloon incident, as well as um, uh, China's continued use of uh, large-scale military uh, exercises around Taiwan. And at the same time, we also saw uh, about mid this year an intensification of U.S. diplomacy towards China, a number of high-level visits to China. So as we look at all of, all of these developments together, um, an interesting question to ask is, given, given these high-level visits and given the direction of the relationship, are we beginning to see a floor? So I've uh, invited two leading experts to debate this, but before we uh, ask them to give their thoughts, I would actually like to poll, poll the audience to get your views on this. Uh, so next slide, please. So um, this is a poll that we would love you, for you to participate in. There's two ways to participate. One is if you take out your phone and you scan the QR code. If you don't know how to scan a QR code, that's not an issue. You can also go to the URL, which is pollev.com slash China Power. Uh, and then once you get to the poll, you'll be able to select agree or disagree. We'll just give folks um, about a minute or two to vote. And please feel free to vote both in person and online. And we'll, um, as we're waiting to for the poll results to come in, I do want to take the time to introduce our distinguished speakers. So to my left, who will be arguing for the proposition, is Rick Waters, Mr. Rick Waters, Managing Director for Eurasia's Group's China Practice. Prior to joining Eurasia Group, Rick was, State was the State Department's top China official for 27 years, a very short period of time. And he oversaw the creation of the Office of China Coordination, informally known as China House, and served as the Deputy Assistant Secretary of State for China and Taiwan. Arguing against the proposition is Mr. Dan Blumenthal, Senior Fellow at the American Enterprise Institute. Dan has served in and advised the U.S. government on China issues for more than a decade, including serving as Senior Director for China, Taiwan, and Mongolia at the U.S. Department of Defense. Um, so I really appreciate both Rick and Dan uh, joining us, and I know there will be some disclaimers in terms of we did ask them to take different sides in this debate, and I think their views are probably a bit more nuanced than what they might be presenting to us today. But with that, let's take a look at what we're seeing from the audience poll. It seems uh, the poll has more or less stabilized. And, and I think Ricky will have a very difficult position. About 16% uh, of the audience believe that we have created a floor, and 84% of the audience believe that we have not created a floor. Um, it goes the other way, it means I, it means I messed up. <laughs> Yeah, so, if, so uh, Rick might have an easier position. If he can, if we come out closer to 50-50, then um, maybe his uh, p points were relatively convincing. Uh, I would also want to show you, before we go into the debate, a poll that we conducted on Twitter for uh, between September 27th and October 4th. Largely the same, but a bit more equally, relatively equally spread with 65.4% that uh, disagree with the proposition and 34.6% that agree with the proposition. So with the uh, difficult task of arguing against what the audience believe, let me actually turn the floor to Rick now. All right. 
Thanks, Bonnie. Um, you know, Bonnie, who's a great friend, she promised me that I, I would uh, have the opportunity to come here and speak to all of you today, which I'm delighted to do. I thought after leaving government I was going to get to not have to defend the administration positions, and now, oh well. So here goes. Um, it, look, it's a privilege to be up here with Dan, who I've, I've respected his writings for a long time on these issues. And, and so I thought what I would do in framing this debate is just to talk a little bit at the outset about what the administration thinks it is trying to achieve. Um, I think what it does not think it's trying to achieve by setting a floor is to change China's policies or strategic intentions. I don't think that the goal is to trade away basic elements of the U.S. China policy or its intentions. I don't think that's what's going on here. I think there's a, a very deep recognition that this is going to be a, a long-lasting uh, strategic competition, and it's not going to be characterized by some decisive transformative end state. It's going to be a steady state, um, a multi-domain competition that is intensifying and that requires a degree of careful management through both the, the hard and the soft tools of diplomacy um, to avoid unintended conflict. And so I think in a way, when you look at the definition of a floor, this, this I think is where we should be precise. I think the administration has two basic goals here. One is avoiding unintended conflict. It's not, it's not to say that, you know, at all cost, but you don't want to have conflict in areas that you don't desire. You don't want it to be a result of accidents or miscalculation. That's one goal, but I actually think if you look at the question of setting a floor, that is, that is not the only goal. The, the other real reason the administration is focused on this is that it is necessary in order to pursue a strategic competition policy that seeks to shape China's strategic environment around it in each of the key domains. It is a necessary condition to be seen as managing the relationship with China responsibly, or at least being the party that is trying to do so. If, if the Americans are seen as reckless, it makes it harder in democratic politics in other countries, and even sometimes in other politics, to align with the U.S. on interests that, that are shared to create that shaping coalition, the goal of which, again, is not to necessarily change China or its strategy, but to raise the cost of individual policies and therefore deter them or affect them. So if you keep those two goals in mind, setting a floor is about avoiding unintended conflict, but also creating an enabling environment for the shaping effort. That, to me, is definitionally the, the the benchmark against which our, our clearly rigged poll should be judged. Um, so let's look at these two things in reverse order. I mean, I think we can argue pretty effectively that, that the shaping effort is, is proceeding apace, you know, in two, two short years with, I think, a lot of bipartisan consensus and, to be fair, building in large measure off of some elements of the previous administration's policy you have a number of things that, that are moving in, in each of the key domains, and I'll just quickly simplify them to the, the global order, including values and informational dimensions, um, economic and technology competition, and then security. And I'm not going to belabor these points. We can go into them in the, the Q&A, but let's at least consider how that necessary condition of being seen, being perceived as trying to manage the U.S.-China relationship responsibly is, is, is an enabling proposition to what has happened. In, in the global order, sort of broadly written uh, domain, you know, two years ago when the administration came in, four of the 15 UN specialized agencies were headed by Chinese nationals. That number has already been cut in half. And I think beyond the, the UN and UN uh, system itself, you have a very rapid emergence of a number of uh, new structures or the strengthening and repurposing of other structures in ways that are very fundamental to um, the U.S. pursuit of strategic competition. You can look at the revitalization of the G7 and its uh, greater ac activism in shaping agendas on everything from cross-strait deterrence and peace and stability to economic coercion. You can look at the AUKUS alliance. Um, you can look at the, the fifth leader-level summit of the Quad and the expansion and diversification of that agenda, and the truly remarkable developments between Seoul, Tokyo, 
and now at Camp David, a new trilateral process that, that will hopefully institutionalize a different level of cooperation between the three capitals. You've got a lot of active, active, uh, activity in the Pacific Islands, including the two uh, summit level meetings that have occurred. And so again, I'm not gonna go through all of the lists, but I think you know, we get a sense of the evolving geometry of the international order, and some element of which I really do think it requires national governments perceiving that the Americans are not being reckless in order to align and support these initiatives. And I think in the values domain and in the defense of democracy here, um, nice thing about being out of government is I can be honest now, you know, I think that the, the challenges are much um, more profound. And I do worry that progress in this area is, is lagging, but I do think that the Bipartisan Uyghur Force Labor Prevention Act and its impact on everything from supply chains to awareness of the forced labor problem is quite profound both, at, both here at home and with uh, allies and partners abroad. So that's the global order dimension that has been enabled by the perception whether or not it's been fully successful of setting a floor. In the economic and tech realm, I think we have um, you know, a number of policies we're all aware of, but I think here the key point I would make is that the administration hasn't traded anything away in its pursuit of, of a bilateral effort to set a floor. I mean, the tariff structure is still in place. It is contributing to debates in C-suites about de-risking uh, from China. The, ad, the advanced technology realm is an area where competition has been taken to a whole different level with the advanced computing restrictions uh, 12 months ago. And, you know, if you believe the press reports, forthcoming modifications that could be upon us shortly. They're the, the legislation that's come forward, um, CHIPS IRA, the Infrastructure Act, but I think it's in the multilateral realm where we often, we often overlook how profound some of the changes have been between the US and the EU through the Trade and Technology Council and now with India um, in the critical and emerging tech realm. So you get the picture. There, there's a lot going on that's enabled by a perception of responsible pursuit of strategic competition and in the security realm, I think Eli touched on a lot of this already. So I'm just gonna skip then to the second reason that one seeks to set a floor with China. And I think this is where we can end by having, you know, a good debate about how successful the administration has or has not been. I, I think it's a bit simplistic to, to believe that you don't have diplomacy with your adversaries. In fact, I think in some ways it's, even more critical than with your friends. Um, but I think there are two points I would make just generally about the type of diplomacy that you have with the Chinese in this environment. One is that it's, it's not, it doesn't look like the diplomacy with China 10 or 20 years ago. It's not big dialogue structures. It's you know, certainly not dinner parties. It's the, the use of unique features of the Chinese system, primarily senior level summit engagement with President Xi to then empower specific channels for specific reasons. And those reasons can often be extremely modest. It can simply be as modest as trying to avoid the Chinese system making up its own story of what Washington intends. And that, that, that goal is actually quite consequential. As we know, just three short years ago, the Chinese convinced themselves somehow that the US was on the verge of a sneak attack. You need channels to make sure that the other side is not making up its own definition of your intentions. So when I talk about the, the processes by which a floor is being created, um, it is admittedly not a very durable foundation, but it is a necessary one that requires the specific empowerment of the Chinese leadership through dedicated channels that again are not dinner parties or you know, scenes from the Netflix show The Diplomat, but more like um, two divorce lawyers fighting over how to not divide the kids physically. That's really the goal here. And I think if you, if you agree with that very modest goal, then I think, you know, the, the, my own sort of personal view would be that the administration has made some modest but fragile success. And it does not last for long periods before it's disrupted by a balloon or by external events. But the, the intention is necessary. And sometimes after a, a an abrupt decline, things stabilize for a period, and that, that may be the best you can get. So I'll, I'll just end by saying that I think we have to really think carefully about what we mean by making progress 
and the definition of the floor and the purpose of this concept. Because I think if, if it really, to me, the debate is almost a definitional one, if you want to come to a conclusion about whether and how to judge the administration's progress thus far. So I'll, I'll wrap up there, and uh, thanks again, Bonnie. Thank you, Rick. A very a powerful opening statement. So, Dan, now the floor is yours. I'm going to ask for There we, there we go. And um, thank you very much. I'm, I'm honored to be on uh, the stage with, with Rick, who's had a distinguished, uh, uh, not yet done, obviously, but a distinguished career in, in government and in China policy, and, and uh, just honored to be on this uh, panel with him. I think um, uh, there's a lot I agree with, but I think the uh, bottom line is um, Rick is sort of making the case for me as to why we're not close to a floor. And let me explain why. Because there's three three reasons, in my view. One is she doesn't want a floor. He he has uh, prepared uh, China for what he calls the great and protracted struggle against the United States. What he wants is a sort of blanket acknowledgement of his core interests, and then perhaps we can talk. Uh, uh, China doesn't believe we want a floor. And that's uh, because of some of the initiatives that Rick so articulately described. And uh, finally, we don't really want a floor. Uh, besides that, we're close to a floor. Uh, we, we, what we really want to do, and I think Rick described it, is undermine China's attempts to expand its power and undo the current world order. We don't want a war, and I think we're trying uh, hard to avoid a war, but we're not quite ready for a floor, in my view, and we're not being completely candid about that, I think, even uh, amongst ourselves. So uh, let me go to point one. She doesn't want a floor. Um, so despite these kind of near-term economic difficulties clearly coming out of the 20th uh, Party Congress, she is, is feeling very confident. Uh, you know, these uh, speeches about under, undergoing changes, great changes unseen in a century, uh, he really believes the West is an inevitable and terminal decline. Uh, the, the greatest feature right now of international politics is chaos. But he said, you know, essentially that uh, in this period of chaos, China can achieve great victories. And I don't think he leaves any doubt about what he means by great victories. It's great victories in his uh, struggle with the United States. Um, so he's, he's really preparing China internally and externally for more what he calls struggle, more protracted struggle. This will be a period of struggle. Uh, the word struggle is used uh, so, so often in, in uh, everything from the party charter to the 20th Party Congress report and, and, and so forth. Prepare for struggle. So he believes we're in a period of struggle, not in a period of negotiating uh, floors. And he believes we're sort of like this old lion who's about to die and has a couple more faint roars in it and maybe can cause some danger. Uh, not as good an analogy as the divorce lawyers, uh, cut it, you, know, you know. But but you know. But we're really kind of this. We're we're on our last legs. We're dangerous, but we're on our last legs. But he can endlessly seize new and greater victories, as as he said in this period. Uh, and um, this is what getting good at struggle uh, has looked like. Uh, you heard some of it from Eli uh, Ratner, which is more. Uh, this is an opportune time to flex military muscles in East Asia, purposefully, purposefully take greater military risks, even seek military crises, uh, so that you can uh, reset, uh, re you know, reset what the new normal is, you know, and, and the defense minister of China famously asked, you know, why are you even in our periphery to begin with? You know, what are we talking about? Why do we need to talk about uh, floors or guardrails? Get out of our periphery, and then we'll talk. Uh, the, other, the other ways we're looking at great struggle right now is, um, you know, this is a time uh, that Xi Jinping is announcing new initiatives to displace uh, U.S. initiatives that buttress the world order. You know, he announced the Global Security Initiative with a very clear, um, you know, very clear target of the United States world order saying, you know, the United States world order is, is what causes wars. 
you know, the expansion of NATO, block politics, hegemonism, Cold War mentalities, that's what causes wars. He's going around the world saying, essentially, you know, uh, I, I support Russia. Russia had no um, choice but to counterattack because the United States used the Ukraine as a pawn, warning other countries, including Taiwan, not to be used as a pawn. Uh, and he's making that case right now, and he's making that case aggressively, and he sees this opportunity with, with the war in Ukraine as a way to pull more countries uh, into, uh, away from the U.S. orbit. Uh, he sees this as a time to uh, broker such meetings as those between the Saudis and Iranians, uh, it, it very much you know, pointing out to us that we're uh, weakened in, in the Gulf and we made mistakes and, and China is going to be the new p power broker. Shora Putin, host Assad, host Abbas, you know, challenging us in, in every way possible everywhere in the world uh, at this moment. Uh, there are just very few signs that, that she is impressed by our power and sees our attempt uh, at guardrails at anything but uh, the sign of kind of uh, the last gasp of, 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 of the lion, so to speak. Um, number two is China doesn't believe we want a floor. And I think that's where Rick, I think, made the case very well. When, when, when China hears, uh, you know, Secretary Blinken speak about shaping the environment through which China will rise, what they hear is, you're containing us. That's what they hear. And, uh, and they say, stop containing us. And it is absolutely true. The administration has made great progress in this, what I would call, containment coalition, or at least containment of its expansion coalition. You know, uh, the South Korea-Japan trilat is, is a great accomplishment. Uh, AUKUS is a great accomplishment. Uh, the fact that NATO is more interested than it was before in relations with Japan, and there's some something of a of a global coalition forming, uh, you know, that is identifying China as a systemic rival. You know, uh, I think that really is the, the beginning of a counter coalition against China, and that's how China sees it, and that's how we see it. Um, and and so uh, they don't believe we want a floor. And when Xi Jinping uh, met with Anthony Blinken. You know, he was very much in a mood to try to purposely humiliate him in terms of uh, the way he uh, arranged the seating and so forth. And, you know, that's very important, as all of you know, in Chinese strategic culture, just who, who is uh, coming as the ardent suitor, who's coming as the, as the visitor, uh, who's coming as uh, the one making requests of, of the other one, and, and how are we going to be seated? We're not going to be seated as equal. Uh, you know, whereas in contrast uh, to his meetings with uh, Bill Gates and Elon Musk and Henry Kissinger really made a point of, of, of downplaying and downgrading his visit with Tony Blinken, but he chided him and he said, competition among great powers does not conform to the trend of the times, let alone solve America's own problems. It was, it was a lecture. Don't come to me with, you know, uh, uh, talking about competition and guardrails. Stop competing. It's not in your interests. And, and inevitably, you will lose. That's, that's the other big message. Inevitably, you will lose. He talks about, in very ideological terms, that, that socialism will prevail over capitalism and so forth. This is not a man who is interested in, in seeking a floor. Uh, Wang Yi uh, you know, told uh, Secretary Blinken, there's no way to turn back the wheel of history. In other words, the wheel of history is turning towards us in China. You know, don't, don't, you know, you're, you're coming here as a supplicant, fine, but, you know, stop this competition. Here's the price if you want to really talk to us. We have a price. And the price is stop hyping the China threat theory and the technological and other sanctions against us. Oppose Taiwan independence. Stop interfering in China's affairs. Now, those are not things that we can do or are interested in doing. Not, not a single one of them. In fact, we're doing the opposite. And, and that will bring me to the, my next point, which is we're not really interested in the floor, at least at not the price that's on the table. Uh, and of course, um, Ching Gong, before he disappeared, uh, you know, started railing against guardrails, railing against the guardrails and saying, guardrails, are you expecting us not to respond to attacks and slander? Now, that's the kind of mood that Chinese high diplomats are in which is you're, you're coming to us to talk about guardrails while you slander us and you contain us and you, and you interfere in our affairs and you don't oppose Taiwan independence. In fact, you support these separatists and so forth. 
And so that finally brings me to the, to the point three, which is we don't really want a floor, at least not at the price that's, that's given to us. Uh, we're not ready to back off from the diplomatic successes that, uh, that, that Rick uh, rightfully pointed out. There are quite a few diplomatic successes. Uh, we still have a lot of work to do to continue to build a coalition that counters China's aggression, that undermines its uh, malign influence. Uh, we're not interested in meeting uh, Tony, uh, uh, sorry, Wang Yi's demands. Uh, you know, uh, I would add to the other, um, to the besides the diplomatic and geopolitical groupings that uh, that that uh, that, uh, that uh, we talked about before that are very much seen as a containment coalition and, and in some ways are very much a containment coalition. I would add that um, the technology restrictions, you know, the October seventh, twenty twenty two technology restrictions. Really, uh, uh, really harm the the Chinese semiconductor industry, right? That that's the Chinese view that as a as a hostile act. Now, these are necessary acts that we have to take, in my view, but uh, they're not viewed uh, as confidence building measures, as guardrails, or as floors by the Chinese. Nor do we really view them as such either. Our security assistance to Taiwan is as strong as it ever has been. Uh, we're not uh, in the business of, of you know, opposing Taiwan independence. Uh, you heard from Eli all the different things we're doing around the region militarily to better posture ourselves. If I was a Chinese strategic planner, I would say, well, they're, they're, really, uh, you know, they're really tightening the noose. I mean, they're really containing us. Uh, so um, I don't think, you know, for, for any of these reasons that we're close to a floor, I think that... Um, I don't think we. I don't think we really, truly want to be. If we, if we were candid, I think we are making uh, attempts. You know, we're sending cabinet officials to China. Uh, you know, to make these kinds of attempts, but they don't. They don't return with very much. They don't return with very much, except for these lectures, and uh, and these kinds of. Uh, you know, the ire of the Chinese. You know, stop doing these things to us that are attempting to contain us, and ultimately, Xi Jinping's very strategy, his very interpretation of geo of the geopolitical time, is that it's time for struggle. Uh, the ascension of his loyalists and his security services uh, in the 20th Party Congress is meant to batten down the hat hatches for struggle. He talks about struggle. Uh, we will see more dangerous military exercises. We, we, we won't see talks between the PLA uh, and the U.S., and that's very purposeful. That's because uh, the way the Chinese think that we will stop our operations around China is if uh, they continue to behave in a manner so risky that we have to back off uh, or else we will get into some kind of unwanted conflict. Thank you. Thank you, Dan. Also a very forceful argument of um, why she doesn't want a floor and the United States doesn't want a floor. But maybe um, before I turn to Rick for uh, Rick, your rebuttals, uh, could I just ask for a quick clarification of what you mean by floor, Dan? I think you were using floor interchangeable with uh, confidence building measures, guardrails, basically ways in which you, uh, the competition would be limited, but I just want to make sure that we get your definition too. Absolutely. So um, I, I was taking the definition that um, that I, I thought was that that essentially we can negotiate a position with China uh, that uh, that uh, where the relationship doesn't descend any further into sort of spirals of tension and uh, open up crisis communication and confidence building channels such that uh, things like um, the balloon incident and, and other incidents, military incidents around uh, China, uh, you know, should something get out of control, we have a way to talk to the, the PLA uh, and ge generally speaking, a, a loosening of tensions, a sort of detente. Great, thank you. Uh, so I think we have two slightly different definitions of how to un uh, understand the floor, but um, hopefully in the rebuttals we'll, we'll start converging the two definitions and we'll have more, uh, more of a um, direct response uh, from both ends. So Rick, over to you. Thanks. You know, I think Dan makes a lot of good points in his presentation. Um, I'll come back to just a few thoughts real briefly. One is, you know, again, I said at the beginning, uh, nobody's going to make the argument that Xi Jinping's going to change his views. I mean, I, you know, spend too much time reading People's Daily and get great enjoyment out of the, uh, the daily imploring to struggle, um, the, the speeches about 
securitization of the economy. I mean, these are, these are real things, and no one is going to debate that. But what I do think is a little bit different, at least in the short term, is that um, things in China are difficult for the leadership right now. And the, I don't expect the rhetoric to change in the long-term strategy, but you know, the short-term strategy right now is to put out fires and deal with a mess inside the leadership. Um, I don't want to take that too far. I think we all have to be modest in our understanding of particularly the inner circle leadership dynamics. But this, this is an environment in which I would imagine if you're sitting in Zhongnanhai, you're, you're getting frustrated at being blamed for a bunch of legacy economic issues that your, your own policy prescriptions are not going to solve. And your new state councilors are running into problems, shall we say, that, that are taking up a lot of your time as well. And, you know, so in a way, the fact that the leadership may not want new external headaches in the short term is a source of modest leverage. I don't think we should overstate that. But I think where you see this playing out, and it's, you know, it's subtle, but it's also in the language, is that 10 years ago, you know, when you would prepare a U.S.-China uh, meeting, there would be a very maximalist definition of what a floor entailed. It would be like a G2 condominium arrangement, new model of great power relations. Let's collude together to solve the world's problems by one side's definition, perhaps. And, you know, in a way, I think because of um, the domestic challenges on the Chinese side this year, I think it is possible to at least posit that the, the price has come down. If you look at the Xinhua statement after the Bali summit between the presidents last year, yes, it's true that, that um, the Chinese still complained about the idea of guardrails, which they think will you know, as they often put it, it will allow the Americans to have seatbelts so they can drive faster in strategic competition. But they didn't challenge the notion of setting a floor. And the language, the older maximalist language has started to recede. The, in some ways, they have actually internalized and repurposed aspects of the U.S. propositions that focus much more modestly on the goals I laid out at the top, avoiding unintentional conflict is one of them. Um, and, you know, I think that, I don't want to overstate the point, but I do want to just point out that I think if you look carefully at the language, there are hints about a desire on the Chinese side for short-term stability. But I think Dan is absolutely right to say that that desire for stability comes at a very, with a very little willingness to pay, pay much political cost, and that's, that's a real challenge. The second thing is that... Um, you know, I think there, there are some indications of where a floor is being set in practical ways. Um, I mean, it is true that with the balloon uh, and with the, the Speaker Pelosi's visit last year, you know, mill mill channels were frozen. They're gradually reopening quietly. But I've never really viewed the mill mill channels as the ones that will play a, much of a role anyway on issues like that. I, I was in Beijing for both the... Uh, accidental bombing of the Chinese embassy in 1998 in Belgrade and for the EP3 crisis in 2001. And, you know, watching these, those chapters in history from the sidelines or from a very junior role in the embassy, it was clear that the only channels that will ever exist in a crisis will likely be the ones approved by the party after they have deliberated the principles of their response, and those will probably be foreign ministry channels or maybe back channels, but the PLA is very seldom the channel for resolution or management of a severe crisis like that. And that was the same pattern that played out during the period of the balloon when the, the primary channels were between um, senior officials at the State Department and the NSC and then Ambassador Chin Gong, or in the field between Ambassador Nick Burns and the foreign ministry. And so you know, again, it's, it's a very thin floor. I don't want to make more of it than there is, but that, that, that's just a steady state of the relationship that will persist. Um, I do think that in some other areas of the relationship, you know, if you look at what we mean by floor, there, there is a risk that China will overreact to restrictions or policies that it misunderstands. And, you know, technology is a great example where coming into this year, I think there was a bedrock conviction that the, the U.S. was embarked on an all-out containment effort to go all the way as far as it could in every aspect of advanced technology. And yet I do think some of the modest channels that have been set up between commerce and their counterparts have started to explain where the boundaries may be. They have shown 
There is a pathway for Chinese firms that are not involved in civil military integration to come off of entities lists. And some of that has been recycled, uh, although it wasn't really noticed because of the, uh, the controversy over the new Huawei phone. You know, it's been recycled even into the official Xinhua releases where they take Gina Raimondo's assurances that the goal is not to block China's economic rise and they start to put those out to their own population. So again, these are very modest, modest um, areas in which on the military side, on the crisis management side, and on the technology side, there are indications of a sort of short-term stabilization. But the final thing I'll say is that, um, you know, I think part of, part of why I'm so focused on the definitional question here is that even implicit in the premise of this debate, I don't know that, you know, I would really agree with the idea that the goal is to manage tensions. There are gonna be tensions. Um, that's fine. The real issue here is to make sure that where there are tensions, they are a product of deliberate strategy and that they don't produce unintended escalation or crisis. And I think if by that goal, uh, by, that, by that definition, we look back at the last year, I still think on balance, the, the strategy has been successful. Because if you look at what, what it would look like without channels, without an effort to, to actively manage, and without some near-term tactical desire from the Chinese for stability, I think what it would have been possible were spirals in areas of the relationship that we could have hardly predicted or foreseen, but that could have been consequential and that could have undermined all of what I started off with at the top, the effort to, to convince allies in the region and elsewhere that the U.S. is trying to manage the relationship responsibly. Thank you, Rick. Before I turn to Dan, let me just uh, make sure that we're capturing your definition of um, the floor. You, you mentioned that it's about avoiding unintentional conflict. And then I would add maybe the examples you raised later, there was also another addition to your definition, which was it seemed to be reducing PRC misperception and inflation of the U.S. threat. Yeah, and you know, I mean, I think we could even add a third part to it, which is um, creating the perception with allies and partners that you were trying to do this. Because that, that may not mean that you've achieved the goal. It might just mean that you're not the one blamed when things go wrong. Thank you. With that, Dan, over to you. Um, again, I, I, I just don't see, even according to the, those definitions, uh, room for very much progress. You know, I think what we're going to see in the next uh, few years, uh, particularly if the election goes in a certain way on Taiwan, is actually uh, more attempts by China to actually deliberately create crisis-like, a crisis-like environment around the Taiwan Strait to, uh, you know, when you, when you uh, puncture uh, you know, ADIs and median lines at this, at this rate, uh, purposefully, deliberately, as part of your strategy of cognitive warfare, um, you know, you're not looking to uh, tamp down military crisis. You're trying to say that if the other party actually reacts, uh, there will be a crisis, so don't react, right? So I think this is structurally a clash of grand strategies. And I think if you, if you take a Cold War analogy, um, uh, first Cold War analogy, I know you have a debate later. I just weighed in on your debate later about, uh, about the Cold War. But the Soviets and, and the U.S. could get into some form of a detente and, and, and tactical floors and managing tensions when they both decided they weren't going to go to war over Germany. But we're not even there with China. We, you know, China, you know, in our view, still very much is holding out the possibility of going to war with Taiwan, against Taiwan. So uh, we have a lot of work to do to stabilize deterrence before uh, we can start to really, the Chinese have to take us extremely seriously when we, uh, when we say uh, we're going to uh, deter, deter them from taking actions we don't like and contain their expansionism before they'll really get into talks with us about some of the issues that uh, Rick pointed out to. So, you know, I don't, you know, I, I think we're in a protracted period of crises on purpose. Uh, the Chinese want to create crises. The U.S. Uh, grand strategy, always, ha which is a soft form of containment of China, and the Chinese know it, always uh, holds out the possibility for, uh, for, for talks and for crisis management. But that's just simply not how the Chinese Communist Party under Xi Jinping sees it. Again, 
the position is stop doing what you're doing, stop interfering in our internal affairs, stop exercising in this way around uh, the region, uh, you know, stop, um, uh, you know, stop trying to contain us, stop reposturing, uh, stop interfering in, in, in Taiwan, stop supporting the separatists, and then we'll talk uh, about a floor, stop competing even. And we're just simply not prepared to stop competing. In fact, I think that uh, in, in response to many of the actions I think the Chinese will take uh, throughout the, from the South China Sea, uh, from the South China Sea to the Taiwan Strait, we're, we're actually going to see more U.S. security assistance, more, as Eli Ratner said today, more deterrence, and the Chinese are going to read that as, uh, as, as containment, and they're going to keep lecturing us about how we have to first stop the containment, and then maybe possibly we can talk about, uh, you know, managing tensions. Finally, you know, I, I don't think the Chinese, you know, the October 7th, 2022, uh, actions we took, uh, yeah, we really harmed China's semiconductor industry. Now, I'm, I'm for the action, right? We really uh, have a new policy of keeping certain uh, capabilities out of Chinese hands writ large, not just the military's hands, China's hands. Uh, they, they can't view that as anything but a, a a, the beginning of a set of actions that, that are coming that are meant to contain and suppress their economy. That's, that's how they see them. Now, we have to do these things. But I don't think, you know, again, if I was a Chinese strategic planner, I would uh, see it as anything but the U.S. moving to a full uh, economic containment policy. And, in fact, that's, that's how the Chinese actually see it. And part of the reason, you know, even in the economic sphere where, uh, you know, we sent a couple cabinet officials to China without, uh, without much to show for it. Uh, and again, you know, sending four cabinet officials to China without a reciprocal visit, the Chinese will not read that as uh, two equal parties trying to negotiate crisis management mechanisms. They will read that as uh, the U.S. being an ardent suitor uh, who will keep coming and keep asking China for things, even if they uh, get turned down? Uh, but again, I wouldn't. You know, if I were if I were China, I completely understand why they read uh, our policy as one of economic suppression. And the Chinese now have a policy through dual circulation and through uh, other means of of trying to protect themselves and insulate themselves as what they think is going to become. Uh, even stronger measures to contain their economy and suppress their economy. So even in areas where you would think that there could be more of a detente uh, in commercial relations, I think the Chinese also view that as another area of struggle, as another area of tension, and another area where it's difficult to, to, to build confidence and uh, you know, to manage tensions and crisis and create that floor. Thank you very much. I think there's just so much to unpack. Uh, I guess I'll start with two more fundamental questions and then um, maybe open this up for questions from the audience because I'm sure folks will have a lot to also ask. Um, I guess two fundamental, maybe related question is, do we need a floor? I think, I think the two of you are coming on opposite end, but I, I think it would just be nice to clarify, do we need a floor in US-China relations? And um, I think, Dan, you use the term uh, a stabilized deterrence. So if we view a floor as stabilizing deterrence, do we need that? And, and, and Rick, you mentioned um, the, that, you know, some, it is, what, what did you say? You said that tensions are fine and some of them, as long as they're a product of deliberate U.S. strategy, right? So both of you are recognizing moving forward that we will have tensions and there will be crises. It will be much more in, um, friction in the relationship. But as we move forward to that, do we need anything to stabilize that or anything to set some boundaries? Let me just start with that first question. Thanks. Whoever wants to go first. <laughs> we'll get you off, off the hot seat. Um, we, 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 do need it. we do need a floor. We do need diplomacy. We do need... Uh, we do need... Um, to negotiate ways to manage tensions and, and to, avoid, uh, to avoid conflict, but we're not close to being in a position to actually negotiate that. There's a lot more work. To, the Chinese will take us seriously uh, once and if uh, we complete the work that Eli Ratner was talking about in terms of 
setting up a new deterrent posture in the region. Uh, we, haven't even we haven't even discussed the level of um, instability the Chinese are, are introducing into the system with their nuclear plans that Eli Ratner meant, uh, meant to, uh, you know, and th there's a reason that, that they're not transparent about it. It's, it's, it's meant, you know, rather than creating confidence, it's, it's meant to undermine confidence. You know, Chinese grand strategy, Chinese military strategy is, is very much meant to undermine confidence and to keep us on our heels. Now, the answer to that, the way to get to a stabilized deterrence is to really finish the work uh, that we've been talking about and Rick art articulated uh, earlier in, in this panel, which is um, these, these various uh, coalitions that we have negotiated have to really uh, take hold and be strengthened and turn into something more than the, you know, something even stronger. So the quad, AUKUS, uh, the trilateral, uh, some of the other mini, mini laterals, uh, more credible combat power has to be in the region, as, as Eli Ratner mentioned, in ways that the Chinese really feel like it's too costly uh, to continue behaving in this fashion. Uh, we need to uh, really deal with the extended deterrence issue that the Chinese are trying to break uh, with the Japanese and the, and the South Koreans. Uh, and we need to change the perception fundamentally in China that we're in terminal decline and that we uh, are in a period where, you know, the next 10 years or so, they can just wait and, and they will inevitably rise and be in a stronger position. Uh, we, we ought not uh, go running to China seeking to taunt when they're not looking uh, to reciprocate. You know, they'll, they'll talk to us when they feel like they have something to talk to us about. And really that, at the end of the day, uh, means continuing the work of building these alliance coalitions, building up the military power, continuing to uh, do the kinds of things we did October 7th, 2022, keeping uh, high technology out of China's hands. Uh, it won't be pleasant. There'll be more conflictual relations during that period of time, but I think we will get to a stabilized deterrence if we, uh, if we, if we take these uh, stronger measures to undermine their confidence, to um, uh, you know, contain their expansion, and, and to subvert their attempts to um, uh, you know, subvert their attempts to under, undo the world order. Well, I, I'm finding myself in too much agreement with Dan, so I'll accentuate the differences just for the fun of it. Um, no, I think I think there are some areas where you know, to be honest, I think. This is where the, the definitional struggle actually comes in. I mean, if you think of, let's quantify this a little bit. Where, where have floors been set? I mean, you look back at, you know, February of last year, Xi Jinping and Putin standing together at the Winter Olympics just before the Ukraine invasion and the, the, the no-limits partnership that is announced and the signal that must have sent to the Chinese system that thou shalt help Putin and Russia in the war effort. You know, you fast forward only three short months and U.S., European, and partner diplomacy succeeded, I think, in setting a floor in the sense that China did not do what many feared at the time and what I think, you know, has been in the public domain. A lot of intelligence professionals and uh, thoughtful analysts were worried might happen, which was that China would translate no limits into provision of lethal support or significant efforts to undermine and evade sanctions. And so I think that's an example of where, you know, I would actually agree with Dan in many of the um, strategic and hard military realms. It's, it's necessary to build ha the hard tools of deterrence before we will get to progress in those areas. But in other elements of the relationship in the diplomatic realm, um, most prominently, I do think there are areas in which um, partial floors have been established that have proven durable even through the, the balloon chapter. And so we have to maybe quantify a bit. I think going forward, and this is where I'll leave off, Bonnie, you know, I think let's look. Let's look at what happens when the administration rolls out whatever the new export restrictions are, the modifications to the October 2022 advanced computing restrictions. You know, how will that affect Who's, who China sends to APEC. I mean, there are questions out there that might be the metric that we can't predict right now. Um, but I, I do think that um, one of the questions that I will be looking at the most closely is there has been a bit of a modest floor of sorts in how the Chinese play in our domestic politics. And, 
you know, in 2016, there were debates in Beijing when I was there about should they go a bit step, a bit beyond the propaganda onslaught, the generalized effort to erode perceptions of U.S. democracy to actually play in the Russian-like interference game. I hope that doesn't happen, but I think that there are floors in some of those areas about how China plays in our politics that, that could be fragile but still persist. Great. Thank you very much, uh, Rick and Dan. I do want to make sure that I'm leaving some time for Q&A. So we have about uh, 15 minutes for questions before we will go return back to our final poll of the audience. So please raise your hand if you have a question, and we will have rotating uh, microphones for those who are here in person. Hi, thanks, uh, Chase Winner with Energy Intelligence. Um, can you talk a little bit about sort of the geoeconomic competition between the two sides? Um, obviously, since we cover energy, I'm interested in the sort of oil sector, but also um, the renewables with, you know, the U.S. industrial policy. And you see now, for example, um, in Europe, sort of a backlash against uh, Chinese EVs. Um, so, yeah, if you could just address sort of how this economic uh, tensions play into the political ties as well. And maybe how economic tensions relate to floor <laughs> in U.S.-China relations too. Well, I'll, I'll uh, thank you for the question. You know, I'll, I'll restate what I said before. You know, economics used to be the area where we, we thought um, you know, it, it's kind of a pressure valve, uh, a place where we could uh, find agreement, where the, the two sides could, could, could trade freely and, and commercial ties and so forth would, um, you know, would, would provide a distraction from, from other forms of competition. But I just don't think that's true anymore. And this sort of goes to the centrality of my argument. I don't think it was, you know, I, 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 it, was, it was the Chinese that really started the, the economic warfare, you know, going back to, it depends where you want to start. I mean, you can you can start with, uh, you know, with uh, not fulfilling their obligations under the WTO. You can start with 2006 Indigenous Innovation Plan. You can start with, um, you know, Made in China 2025, 20, you know, and, and and so forth, which came out in 2015. You know, I think the U.S. has has been slow to react. Uh, you know, very slow to react to a number of things that did great harm to our economy, uh, you know, uh, great dislocations in, in, in our labor force, uh, you know, massive theft of IP. You all know the story very well. Uh, but, but now that we have started fitfully to react, uh, you know, these October 7th, 2022 uh, sanctions, uh, other measures the Trump administration took, some continued by the Biden administration, you know, the Chinese are now uh, saying uh, openly that, uh, you know, economics is, is a domain of, of conflict. Economics is a domain of warfare. Uh, that they have to build their supply chains and use uh, their consumer markets in ways that build leverage over the rest of the world. You know, that it's not so much about uh, economic growth anymore, if at all. It's about who has more economic leverage. Uh, and the Chinese have built positions of great economic leverage from uh, the pharmaceutical supply chain to, uh, you know, to the EV supply chain, as you mentioned, uh, you know, and and again, I think it's it's been a mistake. I mean, you know, to, um, you know, we're we're going to move to a situation where we are more dependent on the Chinese EV supply chain. They will weaponize that, and that's to my point. You know, this is not a country looking for uh, floors or minimizing tensions. This is a country looking for leverage. This is a country looking to struggle with us. This is a country that thinks that, that, that over time they have the advantage and they will keep building points of advantage. Great. Um, happy to take other questions. Oh, sure. One over here. Thank you. I'm uh, Venkat. I'm visiting Fulbright Scholar from India in George Mason University. So, uh, you know, this whole question of floor is intriguing to me because uh, invariably the Chinese would see the Americans as, uh, 
you know, determining where U.S. would cooperate and where U.S. would, US would not cooperate. And uh, therefore, I, you know, so I, I just want to ask, uh, is, is there a need for a floor to be created, number one? Because in the process of creating this floor, you're acknowledging, you know, the growing Chinese presence. And uh, most importantly, I would like to know, you know, Rick's uh, opinion, that is this floor you know, more geared towards building a larger coalition to contain China. Because I think that's the only way this floor is going to, this floor concept is going to work. I don't think, uh, you know, one-to-one -one bilaterally is going to work. It's only going to strengthen China. So, so thank you for the question. Maybe I could... Um, uh sort of package the question a little bit, because we, we, we kind of did already answer the question of do we need a floor, and both had weighed in on that. But I think we were also talking about um, stabilizing deterrence in different periods, right? I think, we're talk I think Rick is talking more about the current period, and I think Dan was talking more about projecting more into the future. Once we have those capabilities, what would happen? So it might be useful if either Rick and Dan want to weigh in on, like, what do we need to do between now and five years from now, when we don't, for, it, hypothetically, let's hypothetically assume we don't have the capability we need between now and five years from now. What do we need to do if we're facing a China that is, as Dan and Rick, I think you're both on the same page, a China that is more willing, more risk-taking, more willing to use military force, more willing to think about leveraging crises for its advantage. What, what happens in that space? Yeah, you know, I'm, the more I hear us talk about a floor, I mean, the more I remember I, I used to work on Arab-Israeli issues for years, and we used to always talk about window of opportunity. And I, I, I once thought, so what, what does that even mean? I mean, we, you go in a door, not a window. Maybe that, maybe that was the problem at the beginning. Um, so maybe, maybe floor is kind of the wrong way of looking at it. Look, I think in a way, I mean, where Dan and I are converging on a lot of these issues, to be frank, is that you know, you, you negotiate from a position of strength. I mean, you, you, you can choose to use negotiating channels for a variety of purposes, but they're not a goal in and of themselves. And that's why I think it's, it's useful to frame this by domain. Um, I think in the, in the security and sort of regional stability realm, you know, it's absolutely true that you have to build both hard deterrence, you have to advance the the process of building Taiwan's asymmetric and whole of society defenses. You have to build out the regional architecture and make sure that it's, it's doing things and not just saying things. And then you, you, that puts you in a position of strength with certain channels. In the economic realm, it's absolutely true that China's uh, state industrial policy and this concept that you transition away from an investment-led growth model in the property sector to one that is much more derivative of new technologies in the EV and ba you know battery and clean energy sector. I mean that that is going to create massive overseas um, dislocation and oversupply and all new frictions that have to be managed. And therefore, you need a comprehensive strategy of building your own strength in industrial policy. You need a trade strategy that includes a market access component in the Indo-Pacific region. And I think that's one area where the administration has not been very successful. But you do still need channels to the Chinese side to explain what you're doing, explain what you're not doing, and manage what is still a $750 billion bilateral trade relationship, whether or not we like it in its current form. And so, you know, I think there's a common thread in all of this, which is that you, you a floor is not the goal. Um, a floor is, I think, a euphemism for using negotiating channels from a position of relative strength for a clearly defined purpose. And, and maybe if we look at it that way, the honest answer here is that the administration hasn't been successful in every domain because they're doing more of the foundational pieces to build that strength initially. But in other domains, I would say there has been some modest success. Well, I, I think, you know, if, if I, I think times ahead will be difficult, you know, to, to quote Xi Jinping. <laughs> and, and we need to dare to struggle as well, uh, uh, to quote Xi Jinping. You know, I think everyone has to quote Xi Jinping now. You know, it, it's uh, uh, Xi Jinping thought. Uh, I think some of the things that Rick described the Biden administration doing are right in the 
um, you know, in, in, in that realm of they are not being afraid to struggle. I mean, these institutions, they're building up uh, some of the economic actions they're taking, uh, you know, deterrent posture, although, you know, there, there needs to be more uh, in that in that area look it's it's critical it doesn't ha the one the other thing i would say is it doesn't have to be far into the future when the, when the chinese uh, reverse themselves and don't see us as as kind of begging them for floors and detente i mean one thing you know i i actually think the chinese very much are supporting uh, putin and and they're they're just having it both ways you know they're they're bucking him up Diplomatically, they're doing all kinds of things uh, right below the threshold where, uh, and even maybe above the threshold where sanctions could be enacted if we really looked uh, more carefully. Uh, things like the aer aer aerospace industry and so forth. Um, so that's one area. You know, if if the United States um, and NATO really succeed in on, on their own terms in that theater, for example then China, in, in a short period of time, might start to think again about whether or not the United States is as weak and in as much decline as they thought we were. That's the kind of calculation I think we need to get to. Uh, you know, undermining Chinese attempts to coerce, uh, you know, and, and as they say, uh, evoke psychological terror in the Taiwan populace, undermining that. Uh, you know, I think would go a long way to showing China that uh, we meet our commitments, uh, we are going to meet our commitments, uh, we are going to struggle too. We are going to struggle precisely at the time, as Rick described, uh, that Xi Jinping is facing difficulties. I think this is precisely the time to create more problems for him uh, when he's feeling less secure at home, such, such that he will have more reason to try to stabilize things. But we have to, you know, we have to dare to struggle. That's that's really the, the slogan that we should take up in order to get to that uh, place of, of, of some stability in our relationship. So in some way, Dan, you're saying Xi Jinping is right. China has to do a struggle and the United States has to well, do a struggle. You know, he started it. <laughs> OK. OK. <laughs> um, with that, I do want to make sure we give our online audience uh, some opportunities. Brian. Um, yeah, so one question is, how do third parties fit into perceptions in Washington and Beijing about putting a floor in the relationship? So, you know, for the U.S. perspective, how do allies fit into that? Uh, and, and from China, how do countries like Russia uh, or some of its other partners fit into their calculus? Well, I, I can offer a few thoughts on this. I mean, one, let's, let's go back to last August and the the speaker's visit to Taiwan, uh, you know, I think there was a, uh, when you look at the, the cross-grade issue right now, I think, you know, the Biden-Harris administration has been trying to build up um, the hard aspects of deterrence, and this has been very much a partnership with, with President Tsai and the Taiwan leadership. But when that, when that event occurred, um, it wasn't just the hard aspects of deterrence that were important. It was also the very slow and deliberative process, working with third parties, working with other governments, to, to signal publicly to Beijing that there was a common interest in peace and stability in, in the cross-strait context. And that, that diplomatic effort, I mean, it does have some real, albeit subtle, deterrence value. But, you know, the flip side of the coin was that Many of the countries who we were working with to negotiate those statements, um, they, they didn't want a U.S. that appeared reckless, that appeared to be triggering crises for reasons that were not strategic. And so I think that, that that's a good example of where third parties come in. They can play a very important role in signaling to Beijing that this isn't just a U.S.-China US problem. It's a global problem. It's a problem that would have immense impact on national economies and different uh, uh, macroeconomic considerations, even for countries in the global south who may think they don't care. But at the end of the day, those third party voices are a critical component, secondary component perhaps, of the overall deterrent effort in the cross-strait context. And that requires uh, an enabling condition, which is the perception of responsible management of the relationship. Uh, 
Sure. You know, I, I think third parties play play an enormous role, and and so many uh, are are asking the United States to to do more to uh, you know to contain China's expansionism, to establish a favorable balance of power. You know, AUKUS, uh, the trilateral with Japan and South Korea, uh, some of the new movements in NATO and the EU. Uh, extremely important, extremely important over time to show China that this is, uh, they will not succeed in what they're trying to do in trying to undermine a world order that has uh, been of great benefit to, to many of these countries. We do have to be very careful, though, in terms of our language. Um, you know, when we start to seem like we're seeking a detente for detente's sake, or we start to um, uh, chase China around for meetings and so forth, it does signal uh, two things to allies at times. One, uh, that those who are on the fence uh, are now uh, seeing the United States kind of uh, move off a, um, a more realistic and uh, hardened policy, and there, therefore they might have an excuse to do so as well. So we, we really need to toe the line and be careful in changing our language from um, you know, competition to detente, changing our language from decoupling to de-risking, because it's tough enough to build these coalitions to begin with. And we don't want to give anyone the perception that we're not sticking to our guns uh, on, on those policies. Great, thank you. Uh, I do want to collect two final questions from the audience here and then wrap it up and do the final poll. So if you have a question, raise your hands So one here. And then I think I saw one in the back for a while. Hi, Lydia from Brunswick Group. I just wanted to understand um, how should we consider the evolving U.S. politics um, in this debate proposition, especially since, Rick, you mentioned this is a long-lasting kind of competition relationship, and Dan, you mentioned that it's very important to strengthen coalition, but how will our allies uh, look at our um, internal like political scene and you know how will that play into uh, this proposition <clears throat> my name is Samar Chatterjee Safe Foundation um, I, I guess uh, the relationship between China and the United States is a relationship between two big bullies you know uh, United States has been since the Second World War, at least, and maybe before in South America, um, was a big bully. Uh, and the Chinese have been historically, but there was a period where they were subjugated by the Western powers and so on. So, but now that after China, Nixon's visit was a clear indication that China wanted a change in relationship with respect to Soviet Union. And therefore, they were using the United States, and the United States was using China against the Soviet Union, as well as India. But that was the, uh, because India told the United States, please don't visit China, don't create a relationship. However, this rocky relationship should continue unless it leads to a third world war, because it appears now it's not going to be the third world war between the United States and Russia. It, it's probably going to be the United States and Russia and China unless U.S. changes its policy and moves one of them out. So sorry, did I hear a question there? Uh, yes, I, I don't think there is a solution other than keep bullying each other and finding ways because you've got to live on the same earth, so you cannot keep fighting. You've got to come to some agreements and, and Russia, uh, China knows that. There okay. is Thank not you. going to be just pick and choose. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, we have like oh, two minutes, so pick and choose whatever questions that you may want to weigh in on or not. Uh, the easy question of U.S. internal politics. Um, <laughs> you know, I, 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 look, I think uh, President Biden is, is correct about um, we have got to demonstrate that democracy can deliver. Uh, it's under threat worldwide. It's under threat uh, by China. It's under threat by Russia. Uh, it's under threat by uh, states aligned with them. And, uh, you know, we, I have confidence that we will, will work through our own uh, domestic ills, but we, we have got to show, uh, you know, we have got to show that democracy delivers the way that authoritarian governments uh, 
uh, claim to deliver. And, and I think we do have an opportunity here because uh, China's economy is not delivering in the ways that they're, uh, you know, sort of going around the world and touting to say that, look, you know, the democratic capitalist model still really delivers better than, than the authoritarian, you know, socialism with Chinese characteristics model. Great, perfect timing. We have one more minute for the, our final poll. Um, so I think, um, I think our speakers are actually more aligned than actually arguing against each other. So maybe let's, let me add a, a, a slight adjustment to the poll. So the United States and China are making some progress in creating a floor in U.S.-China relations and managing tensions and crises. Let's, let's add that sum in there to see if that changes this poll at all. This is very interesting. So I think most people <laughs> agree that um, we're not making too much progress. So I think they're very much aligned with both of you. And I think um, they're all, they also, however, are seeing maybe some hopeful elements of there. So I would uh, commend you for both having an excellent uh, debate and both presenting very forceful arguments. So thank you both very much. I, I, I call this a, <laughs> I think this is a draw. She changed, she changed the question, to be fair to Dan. <laughs> I think, yeah, I think, I think. <laughs> and, and I'm telling you, we did not manipulate the polls. Yeah. <laughs> there, was, there was some rigging here. I'll leave that to the. So we're going to take a 15 minute break. We will start again at 11.55.
Uh, folks, we need to start relatively soon, so we'll plan to be on time, 11.55. Folks, we're going to get started, and I apologize for uh, scheduling a late lunch. Um, part of it was we had a, such a brilliant um, set of experts who had availabilities at only at certain times, but I think you will not go hungry in terms of at least intellectual food for thought during this panel. We, for this panel, will be focusing on the proposition that Xi Jinping has signaled that reunification with Taiwan is a legacy issue that he must achieve during his term in office. Uh, as you know, and Eli talked a little bit about this earlier during his keynote speech, um, Xi Jinping has made clear that he does not want to pass the Taiwan question, Taiwan problem, to be passed down from one generation to the next. So this discussion will feature actually two folks who both in some ways disagree with this proposition, but in different ways. And they will sh share how um, they view both the timeline for unification as well as how Xi Jinping looks at this question. Um, but before we do that again, we want you to vote. Uh, so uh, next slide, please. The voting here is gonna be a little bit more complex, um, mainly because our two experts disagree on what they disagree about with respect to the proposition. So we actually have three choices for you. The voting process is the same, um, and please uh, take a, I think you can read the three choices yourself. I was also told earlier that um, in the prior debate, I didn't wait long enough for the online results to come in, so I will wait a little bit longer. And the actual results from the prior debate uh, was in favor of Dan at 46 to 53. Okay, while we're waiting for the poll, let me, t let me introduce our two speakers and I'll introduce them in the order that they are presenting. So our first speaker is Ms. Bonnie Glazer, uh, Managing Director of German Marshall Fund's Indo-Pacific Program. She also is a non-resident fellow with the Lowy Institute in Sydney, Australia and a senior associate with the Pacific Forum. And she has worked at the intersection of Asia Pacific geopolitics and US policy for more than three decades. She should be a very familiar face to you since I took over her portfolio and her program. So uh, as you know, Bonnie Glazer started the uh, China Power Project. Our second speaker is Mr. Chas Radia. He's a research staff member at the Institute for Defense Analysis at the US China, US -China Business Council. Uh, sorry, no, that's not right. He's a research member at Institute for Defense Analysis. Uh, defense Analysis. I'm not sure where the second part came. 
Uh, and I also uh, am a staff adjunct at IDA, so I'm not sure why that came out that, right, that way. He concentrates his research on U.S. national security and defense policy and analysis of China's national and defense strategies and governance. Prior to joining IDA, uh, he served as the inaugural Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense for China within the Office of the Secretary of Defense. So thanks again for both of them for joining us. So let's take a look at the poll results. Um, it seems like at least over 50 percent, almost, uh, yeah, more than 60 percent of those don't agree that Xi Jinping has signaled Taiwan must be unified during his term. But there's very, there are different reasons why people disagree with that. And it seems the majority, uh, or almost most of the folks, 49 percent, agree that U.S.-China relations will determine when China is forced to unify with Taiwan. So. I think you're in the same situation as Rick, uh, in a more difficult position. So, Bonnie, let me turn to you first. I think Bonnie will argue for more of the position that Xi Jinping has not signaled Taiwan must be unified during his term. So, Bonnie, over to you. I think you'll probably find more agreement than disagreement between me and Chad. But first, I'd like to thank uh, Bonnie Lin uh, for continuing to hold the annual debates on crucial questions related to Chinese power and for all the fantastic work that she and her colleagues are doing uh, at the China, China Power Project. And second, um, it is an honor to share the stage with Chad Sobragia, who is really among the best scholars on China and for whom I have enormous respect. So I am arguing against the proposition. In other words, I maintain that Xi Jinping has not signaled that reunification with Taiwan is a legacy issue that he must achieve during his term in office, and we, of course, don't know how long that will be. But the key term in this proposition that we are discussing is signaled, so we are not debating what Xi Jinping thinks. We cannot read his mind, um, but signals include words and actions, and I will discuss both. So the first point that I want to make um, is that it, it is essential to pay close attention to what Xi Jinping says about Taiwan, and it's necessary to compare his statements with what his predecessors have said. We need to identify what is new and what is not. Uh, much of what Xi Jinping has said about Taiwan has been said by previous leaders or published in party uh, or government documents that were issued before Xi Jinping came to power. So in my view, it is not accurate to conclude based on rhetoric that Xi Jinping views reunification as, as especially more urgent than Hu Jintao or Jiang Zemin did. And I'm going to give you some examples. Um, so uh, Xi Jinping has said, you know, Taiwan is inal an inalienable part of China. Uh, this has been included in the 1993-2000 white papers. He's warned, of course, that um, uh, he would not rule out the use of military force. Um, uh, and Jiang Zemin, even as far back as his eight-point proposal on Taiwan in 1995, issued warnings that military action would be taken if there were concrete moves uh, to secure Taiwan's independence. There was a statement in the 2000 white paper on Taiwan that said that if grave event, turn of events occurs uh, to, uh, leads to the separation of Taiwan from China in any name, or if Taiwan is invaded and occupied by foreign countries, or if the Taiwan authorities refuse indefinitely the peaceful settlement of cross-strait reunification through ne negotiations, the Chinese government will be forced to adopt all drastic measures possible, including the use of force to safeguard sovereignty and territorial integrity and fulfill the great cause of reunification. So that's a pretty wholesome, full some statement that goes all the way back to the 2000. Most of you would be familiar with the anti-secession law, 2005, um, uh, where there is an article that says non-peaceful needs and other necessary measures can be legitimately employed if Taiwan independent forces um, uh, cause the fact that Taiwan cedes from China or major incidents occur resulting in Taiwan's secession from China or, importantly, possibilities of peaceful unification are entirely lost. My second point is um, Xi Jinping inherited the policy guideline, and this is important in Chinese parlance and in their policy. It's the policy guideline of peaceful reunification in one country, two systems, and the strategy of pursuing peaceful development um, uh, of cross-strait relations. And in the last 11 years he's been in power, he has not changed the guideline or the strategy. So 
any document you look at, any statement that is made, is most recently repeated when they launched the new integrated development zone between Taiwan and Fujian, includes these statements. So if Xi Jinping had wanted to signal urgency, he could have adopted a new guideline and strategy, but he is not. Third point. Xi Jinping's statement at the 19th Party Congress uh, political report that reunification is essential for national rejuvenation has a very long lineage. So you have an authoritative party state discourse that has long framed national unification as a critical part of national rejuvenation. So this goes all the way back to the 15th Party Congress in 97 when Jiang Zemin uh, loosely linked reunification with national, with national rejuvenation, when he said the complete re reunification of the motherland and the comprehensive revitalization of the nation will certainly be achieved. Didn't say it was a precondition, but said them in the same sentence. And then in 2007, Hu Jintao um, actually connected these more firmly. This is the 17th Party Congress. He said, cross-strait reunification is a historical necessity for the great rejuvenation of the Chinese nation. So yes, Xi Jinping, 19th Party Congress, said it is essential. Uh, reunification is essential for national rejuvenation. But there's a history here. It really isn't completely new. Um, Jiang Zemin and Hu Jintao talked about realizing the goal, to a goal of building China into a rich, strong, democratic, and civilized socialist country by the 100th anniversary of the founding of the PRC, middle of the century. So Xi Jinping isn't the first to refer to basically 2049 as a target date, which is what he said at the 19th Party Congress. Um, and interestingly, Xi Jinping has deliberately stuck with the same target that his predecessors have set, right? So um, Xi Jinping will be 96 years old um, in 2049. He probably, according to actuarial tables, will not be president of China. I probably shouldn't say explicitly where he might be. Um, but in any case, um, uh, he could have set a firm deadline for reunification um, that um, would, would have could have fallen during his third or his fourth term in office. So he had the opportunity to do that in 2017 or at the 20th Party Congress in 2022. And his decision not to do so, to pull that deadline forward and say something more explicit, I think indicates that this is not a hard deadline. Instead, Xi Jinping is signaling the importance of reunification while avoiding a rigid or near-term timeline that would limit his options, that he continues to need that flexibility. And again, notice that word signal. Okay, fourth, some people cite Xi Jinping's statement that differences across the strait should not, not be passed down from one generation to the next as signaling urgency. So I was not here to hear Assistant Secretary Ratner's statement, but a lot of people in our community of experts um, and uh, particularly people in the intelligence community and the Defense Department do cite that. So this is my view. Um, in analyzing this statement, we cannot ignore the context. Xi Jinping first said this in October of 2013, and he said it to former Vice uh, President Vincent Xiao from the KMT on the sidelines of APEC. And what exactly did Xi Jinping say? He said, from a long-term point of view, the long-standing political differences between the two sides of the strait must be resolved one step at a time. We cannot continue passing these problems down from one generation to the next. Now, KMT President Ma Yingzhou was in power, of course, at the time. This was a period of relatively positive cross-strait relations. It was before the Sunflower Movement, when the students took control of the legislative UN and they opposed the signing of the Cross-Strait Services Agreement. So my view, Xi Jinping's statement was not intended at that time as a threat, but was rather an appeal to continue to improve cross-strait relations step by step. Xi Jinping repeated this once, January 2nd, 2019, in the message to Taiwan compatriots, the only comprehensive speech Xi Jinping has made. Um, and so, um, you know, my guess is the speechwriter um, in China, probably not too different than it is in other places, um, that the speechwriter probably pulled together prior statements, you know, and this was among them. Xi Jinping hadn't said very much up until that point. Um, and uh, it, it, it survived the cutting room floor of whatever else was cut from that speech. This statement is noticeably absent 
from the white paper in Taiwan that was issued in 2022. It was not included in the political report to the last party Congress. So again, in my view, Xi Jinping is signaling certainty about the final outcome. Reunification must be achieved eventually, but he attached no timeline to it. Um, Xi Jinping has not said that his generation has to solve the problem of Taiwan once and for all. So let's be clear about that. Okay, two more quick points. Five, um, what's the significance of the year 2027? So 2027, it's the 100th anniversary of the founding of the PLA, and it carries important symbolic significance. Um, the U.S. intelligence community has told us Xi Jinping has instructed the PLA to be capable of taking Taiwan by force by 2027. Um, but it also emphasized um, that we hear from our intelligence community that this is not a statement of intent. So Avril Haines, um, uh, Director of National Intelligence, told Congress, we continue to assess that even with respect to Taiwan, that China would prefer to achieve unification um, for, by peaceful means as opposed through the use of force. And General Milley very explicitly said, Xi Jinping wants to acquire the capability to seize Taiwan, but there is no evidence to conclude that Xi has an intent or has made a decision to invade Taiwan by 2027. There's numerous examples of Xi Jinping telling the military to get combat, to get combat ready. Um, and although I don't have time to make this case today, I would argue that Xi Jinping has low confidence in his military to take Taiwan today and that he recognizes that the risks of failure are very high for him and for the legitimacy of the Chinese Communist Party. My very last point goes to the issue of actions. And Xi Jinping has clearly given a green light to the PLA to conduct military activity close to Taiwan on almost a daily basis. And the PLA is holding military drills that are obviously aimed at preparing for a blockade and invasion, other potential contingencies against Taiwan. So does this signal that he is urgent to achieve reunification during his tenure in power? Um, the PLA has been instructed to inquire capability. It needs to hone its skills. And if China's military threats are not credible, deterrence will be weakened. Um, and I think Xi Jinping knows that. Um, China needs to demonstrate resolve and signal that there are red lines that should not be crossed. And I think that is one of the goals of conducting these military activities. And finally, those are the messages um, that, so these are the messages that Beijing is sending. It's not that it is urgent to achieve reunification through the use of force. So in sum, Xi Jinping has not signaled that reunification with Taiwan is a legacy issue that he must achieve during his term in office. Thank you, Bonnie. A, a very Whoops, strong sorry argument. That. And uh, I, I love how you numbered your arguments so we could easily follow them. Uh, so Chad, over to you. I think um, in some ways you and Bonnie ag agree that you both disagree with the initial proposition, but in different ways. Uh, yes. Uh, first, I'll have to thank CSIS for hosting the 8th Annual China Power Conference. Um, I'd certainly also like to thank Bonnie Lin for the invitation, uh, but frankly, uh, maybe she should thank me because uh, for the courage to face questions with Bonnie Glazer. I mean, she's uh, an icon here previously and certainly in the community, and I, I have such deep respect for her. Um, I think I'd rather face the PLA in negotiations, perhaps. Is that the highest compliment I can provide? Um, <laughs> nevertheless, I applaud, I, I applaud the topic and certainly Bonnie's uh, uh, opening remarks. In fact, I agree with her, period. Uh, everything... Not, I really didn't hear a single thing I disagreed with. Um, rather than moving directly into question and answer, however, <laughs> uh, I do think it's important to provide some contrast, perhaps, and, and turn the map around and, and, and look at it, uh, look at this problem or this statement through additional context. And so what you might hear is a little bit more of a chorus to a homily rather than two competing preachers. Um, but sometimes the chorus has interesting words, too, and so I'll try to draw those out. Uh, my aim here is really to illuminate considerations and calculus that point to important contextual caveats uh, to the conclusion that Xi Jinping has not signaled that unification with Taiwan must be achieved during his term in office. However, I think there's actually a, a much deeper and more important story to tell. And so that's a teaser, if you hadn't noticed that. Uh, my main point is that Washington really should consider, and others, uh, a, a new paradigm that encompasses deterring 
uh, traditional scenarios of party aggression, uh, such as against Taiwan, which is in this case, but to do so within a broader strategic context and recognize really that China already has done so. That's really where they're at. The bottom line is that the paradigm concentrated kind of exclusively on deterring potential Chinese aggression around a local object or against, in this case, uh, uh, she, uh, she's decision to do this as a legacy issue is really not sound and probably hasn't been that way for at least a decade. Uh, the existing paradigms that frame China's use of force to compel unification of Taiwan are very convenient and we still latch on to those. The poll actually showed that, I think, a bit, right? I think that they're convenient because they're familiar. Um, it's been the framework really for about 70 years, uh, but they are reductionist frameworks and um, really have failed to keep pace with the changing dynamics of U.S.-China competition and perhaps catastrophically so if, if we're not more attentive. Uh, before I get to this argument, though, I, it's important uh, to offer, I think, three caveats to the main question so I stay on topic and don't get too rambling. Has she signaled that unification with Taiwan must be achieved during his tenure in office, a term in office? Tenure, I guess, is better. No. But there's a but here, right? I think there's important buts, and I'll try to bring those out. Honestly, either a yes or no answer may be ill-advised because they're, they associate the risk to kind of a temporal marker. And I think this is something that Bonnie was raising specifically, which is, when the truth is, is that China's choice is very clearly a conditions-based, at least up until mid-century. Right? If we assume that there's a temporal marker, it really kind of paints a false picture, or paints a false picture that danger is at some point in the future, and until that point, there is lesser danger or no danger. Right? Conversely, if we reject that she seeks unification during his tenure, it, it kind of it may paint a false picture that that he won't use force in order to uh, buy time and kind of amass the power for some successor down the road. And so I, I just find, frankly, the truth is that we, that we risk conflict today, tomorrow, and the danger, frankly, mounts every day as we approach mid-century, really unless a major change of a condition occurs. But it's the timeline that's the problem, uh, rather than understanding is the conditions based. So there's three kind of caveats I'll try to tease out or help support that. First is the caveat of preventing permanent loss of Taiwan, which Bonnie raised. Although Xi has not set a requirement to unify Taiwan during his tenure, China will act militarily to either prevent permanent loss of Taiwan or if they, they conclude, the party concludes or she concludes, the trajectory toward unification is substantially degraded, as the party says, off track, uh, which is likely a key element of Taiwan's strategy as the party has recently kind of reformulated in, in, in the last few years, uh, consistent with its past, as Bonnie noted. Some conditions are codified in PRC law as non-peaceful obligations to unify if events arise that could lead to Taiwan's permanent separation from China. Washington, in this light, cannot assume that if Beijing perceives trends which point to a permanent loss of Taiwan, that China will be restrained from undertaking military action simply due to an unfavorable correlation of forces or even faced with damaging long-term consequences to its developmental interests. I recall very clearly PLA communicating to, this, to us this very point, which is don't assume that, we, that because we conclude that we will lose that we won't go. Right? And so that, that, that's a caveat to this, this clause that we're, we're discussing. This is one reason why the connection between Xi's tenure at, or markers like 2027 or 2035 PLA modernization goals and a party decision to use force against Taiwan are really kind of false indicators. China will use force whenever permanent loss is at stake. That's one condition. Second is the caveat that mid-century unification is um, an imperative. Um, uh, party Congress reports and other authoritative statements consistently associate uh, the unification of Taiwan, Hong Kong, and Macau with a basket of goals that altogether compose the party's mid-century uh, end state. Uh, and, and Bonnie talked about that, I think, very clearly. Um, but I'll highlight that that actually generates a very unique condition. Specifically, unless peaceful arrangements are reached by the people of both sides of the strait, conflict is, by definition, inevitable. This implication is that the party's imperative establishes a timeline for conflict 
that progressively displaces crisis prevent prevention approaches by Beijing and, and Washington and Taipei and others as 2049 approaches. And perhaps worse, really kind of drives Beijing to pursue military modernization and national course of power that compounds risk of crisis. So every day that we move forward, this, this problem set just gets worse. It doesn't get better. And, you know, the one disagreement I would have with the, the keynote address this morning is, is conflict not inevitable? Well, I, I think we would hope not, but I don't understand in this logic of why it is not, uh, barring some unforeseen change of condition. In other words, we're really kind of on a countdown timer to some extent that bears on the current relationship relations in the situation since the long-term trajectory is the, really the prevailing North Star for China, not the current date, but mid-century, excuse me. For China, adherence to a timeline for unification will ultimately take priority over war avoidance, and until then, Taiwan will remain a source of chronic crisis and intractable condition for really all the capitals involved. Until mid-century, China's use of force will be driven by conditions, not timelines, or the caprice of an individual leader. But, mid -century, but the mid-century marker does drive progressively worsening conditions over time. Preparation for military confrontation will gather momentum, regardless of any other crisis avoidance measure, or most, I should say, um, U.S. coercive capability or credibility will gradually decrease, and the link between cross-strait crisis and the likelihood of U.S.-China conflict will increasingly harden. This drift will impact operational and strategic designs, really, of all parties, particularly in terms of accelerated war initiation criteria uh, as a strategic impediment to war termination criteria and as an enduring driver of, frankly, the more dominant factor, which is broader U.S.-China competition. The third and kind of closing uh, last point, my third point, uh, is the caveat uh, is the ex exploitation of fading U.S. resolve or, or capabilities. This is a lower probability of occurring, but it's one that we have to discuss, which is absent coercive credibility by the United States, China faces much less challenging restraint to achieve Taiwan unification through force. That's just true by facts. Potential U.S. intervention in a Taiwan scenario deters China's decision to use force by both military denial of Beijing's armed aggression and by putting at risk Beijing's other mid-century goals that require a stable international environment and secure access to the global system. China's response to credible U.S. deterrence has been to modernize and develop comprehensive national power so as to be so overwhelming that in the future, Taiwan not, cannot resist the, as U.S. power weakens, which is China's view. Washington's ability to intervene will just become ineffective or invalid. The implication for Washington is that, it, is that Washington is compelled to maintain a military advantage, but the military element of deterrence will fade over time as non-military features of deterrence become more dominant. And in the case of the United States, not sustaining that deterrence incentivizes Beijing to take advantage. This premise, the premise is here that maintaining military advantage over China will have, to be a, will have to be supplemented by broader capacities to impose cost on China's ability to achieve other objectives that compose its mid-century goals. But denying China its developmental aspirations actually also removes a key strategic constraint on Beijing's calculus to compel unification in, in the first place. So this gets very complicated. It is not a simple yes or no question. Uh, these three caveats, uh, to kind of close out here and get off the stage uh, soon, um, three caveats here kind of help inform kind of a larger understanding, and I'll try to move through this quickly. Sweeping changes in China's capabilities and fresh perspectives on Beijing's national agenda have driven the United States to revise its view of China, yet we still debate the question of conflict over Taiwan if it's distinct and separate from broader U.S.-China competition, or even an element of that. In the past, the U.S. choice to intervene in a conflict over Taiwan was generally judged kind of very much in isolation and as a kind of a consideration of Taiwan status, almost if we were bestowing upon them something and, and, uh, and otherwise it would not affect us. China, however, expects and is preparing for conflict with the United States that will escalate much more quickly and will be greater in scale and intensity uh, than, in, than what is merited by whatever the two are actually fighting over. Worse, China is increasingly, uh, increasingly fears the United States will intervene in a conflict to prevent China's drive, specifically as a war aim of itself, right? So they're already connecting these things together. In fact, this is the very point. Catalysts for U.S.-China conflict, like Taiwan, must be managed as a chronic source of crisis and intransigent, intransigent uh, conditions that fuel the bilateral rivalry. Specific to the question posed today, the considerations of how proximal causations of war, such as Taiwan, and distal causations of war, 
the broader and more significant U.S.-China competition, how they interact is a much more important question. So we, can't, we can no longer kind of insulate the question of China's objective or aim or Xi's view um, absent the, the complexities of the broader strategic competition, yet we kind of continue to do so. So I think that's why this is a good question today. And, and I'll just you know, close by saying it, this artificial bifurcation of those two conditions is, is really reductionist and we should avoid that. There's probably better questions here and, and I'll pause there for. Thank you. Thank Can you I should. add one more thing though? Yeah, of course. Um, just to highlight it, how hard it is to write an email to both of you at the same time, having come <laughs> with two Bonnies, two different spellings, and from the same organization in the past, and that, that was probably my har hardest area of research. So. <laughs> Well, thank you, Chad. Um, before we turn back to Bonnie Glazer, I did want to just make sure I, I, I captured your argument. So I think you, you, there's multiple parts to your argument, but the first part was what I wanted to make sure I understood, which is I think you were arguing that even though there is, there is no she-specific timeline, because 2049 has been mentioned again and again, you, you believe that given the current trajectories, conflict is very likely. Uh, by 2049, and particularly as we get closer and closer to 2049. And you are also saying that um, that as we get closer and closer to 2049, that uh, um, um, so that sorry that that we will see more and more crises as we get closer and closer to 2049. So even if we don't see China proactively launching an invasion or some form of conflict against Taiwan, the risk of that those crises evolving into conflict is also increased. Yeah, I, um, I think that's a good summation. I, 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 the bottom line is, I, I think I agree. I agree with what Bonnie uh, Bonnie Glazer sent uh, said. Um, although I think that there's important caveats to that, which is it's not just a very clean no or yes. Uh, more broadly, I would argue is that that in some ways, not to, to attack the, the question, but it, it's actually kind of the wrong question, which is, is she, has he signaled unification with Taiwan as a legacy issue that must be achieved? It's more as, does she, you know, contemplate going to war with the United States about this issue? Because that's really where his decision is mostly going to lay, although there's pressures that will drive him towards that and, and certainly change the calculus of that question. But I think you are also arguing that she is, or probably not she, China's leadership is more likely to contemplate going to war to, 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 uh, over this issue as they get closer and closer to 2049, if I understood your position correctly. Uh, yeah, I think that, well, they said that they have to have, this says Bonnie explained is unification is closely associated with those mid-century goals. It's up to them to determine whether, uh, what the degree of unification or the progress towards that is. But absent that, it looks like force is extremely likely. Uh, it does not look like the Taiwan, uh, the people of Taiwan, the governance of Taiwan, ever in the future wants to unify with the Communist Party state. And it doesn't, um, and I don't think that the United States position is one that would would ignore the condition of, of China undertaking compelled military action against Taiwan uh, absent you know, some rational cause, right? And so the confluence of both all of those leads you to either conflict occurs or some other change of condition off ramps or off tracks one of those, one of those requirements. And so I just don't understand how this comes out any other way uh, absent a significant change of condition. Yeah, thank you very much, Ed. I just wanted to... Uh make sure that we're understanding your position. Also, because you and Bonnie actually have very similar positions to tease out areas where there might, may or may not be differences. So, so Bonnie, uh, over to you. Okay, I will try to tease out uh, some differences. Um, but first I will say that I agree that if Xi Jinping per perceives that there is the real possibility of permanent loss of Taiwan, that he would go to war whether he perceives that the PLA is ready or not. And I think that is an important point. Um, and I think that that would most likely occur if it is a combination of Taiwan ha being seen as really having a pathway and declaring independence and the United States supporting it. And I think both are important. Um, and uh, I actually think we are in a situation now, which is why I think it is dangerous that the PRC is worried about both of those uh, trends. 
so uh, I, I agree with that point in a sense 2027 or 2035 are sort of um, uh, not really what we should be focusing on because uh, we should consider the possibility that the circumstances, the conditions arise that Xi Jinping perceives he has to go to war. So I'm certainly not arguing that um, he will not use force if he is uh, pushed into a corner or, or perceives uh, that it is essential. And I will mention that I was on a, a panel, I guess about a week ago, with Lonnie Henley, uh, where I think he made a very important point that it's necessary for Xi Jinping to keep, um, to, to conclude that there is a pathway uh, eventually to uh, unification, that policies by Taiwan and by the United States don't close that door. We don't want him to conclude that it is absolutely impossible to achieve unification uh, peacefully or without force, since coercion is, an <clears throat> coercion is a very increasingly important part of their strategy. Um, and, and I agree with that. I think that it is unwise for uh, both Taiwan and the United States to be pursuing policy and actions that would lead Xi Jinping to conclude that it's absolutely um, impossible to achieve some mutually acceptable outcome. But I will disagree perhaps on one point. And it's this issue of conflict is, um, is conflict really inevitable if differences can't be resolved? And if Xi Jinping still holds out the possibility that there is a pathway forward toward integration, if he believes what the party said in its documents, that time and momentum, when it comes to reunification, is on the side of, uh, of Beijing, then ultimately he will be making a calculation. Um, what are the costs? What are the benefits if he's not pushed into a corner? And um, again, my former colleague here, Kath Hicks, um, uh, has said publicly many times, you know, we want Xi Jinping to wake up every day and say, today is, is not the day. Uh, so even if he wants to do it, he's always going to be calculating what the risk is to himself, his position, regime stability, the, the rule of the Chinese Communist Party. So, I mean, uh, and, and finally, that then goes to the point, so what happens if you get to 2049 and reunification hasn't taken place? And, you know, is there a scenario there where ultimately Xi Jinping has not said clearly what constitutes, what are the markers for national rejuvenation? It's a world-class military, right? Um, and, and uh, you know, it's fully socialist uh, China. Um, very, very vague indicators. And, so he could, at any point in time, say, we have achieved national rejuvenation. Oh, we're making progress towards reunification, right? And, and, and maybe he can say that because there's something to point to. I don't know, maybe it's five more agreements with Taiwan that are um, economic agreements, something that he could point to. Um, maybe a change in uh, the, the party rule uh, or just you know, public opinion polls should, should that show that more people identify themselves as, you know, both Chinese and Taiwanese. What could not rule out that that could happen or ways that he would think about it? So maybe conflict really isn't inevitable. So those, I'd appreciate your thoughts. I gotta tell you, that's great. I love that. Uh, yes, I totally agree. Um, I've always kind of wondered, you know, there seems to always be a little bit of wiggle room in their statements. Now, that's not unusual to this. I think about anything I've ever done with the Chinese, it's always had a little bit of wiggle room in there. Um, in fact, uh, if you've served in D.C. at all, I think any policymaker likes to have a lot of wiggle room. Um, so there's hedging language there, and, and it's not clear why that is. It's because they don't have confidence that they can achieve this, and I agree it's, it's uh, the... You know, the, the priority right now remains incentivizing actions and, and a peaceful resolution or peaceful unification, I guess. Um, but here's the problem, you know, kind of putting my policymaker hat on, which is, okay, there's some wiggle room there. But I got to tell you, that goes both ways, which is, if I'm a policymaker in D.C. or some other capital or Taipei, 
And to say that there's wiggle room in that argument, it's like, well, the wiggle room could also include that conflict is, an, is possible. And you have, to, you have to bet that, that if that's possible, that it means you have to prepare for that. And, and so that's kind of the problem, which is a, a squishy answer by the Chinese or a squishy definition of this is um, as good as a hard yes is what you have to have is, and, and that's why we do this, you know, through diplomatic action, as you know, is we, we take definitive stances. This is what our position is. It's this and it's not that. And that's not what you have from the Chinese side here. Uh, and so I, um, I also suspect, like, the Chinese practice of setting strategic goals out in distance, um, they set very vague, distant goals. And as you get closer to them, they start to refine those and add specificity to them and develop new further out ones. Um, the the world-class army is a good example. I remember talking to the PLA is, what is a world-class arm, you know, military mean? And they go, well, we don't know. And I go, well, are you going to do informationization or intelligentization? They're like, listen, are you crazy? It's like 30 years out. Um, you know, when we get into that area, we'll kind of tell you because we'll know, but we have no concept of what warfighting is at that point. All we know is we want to be world-class, which means we'd be pure or better than anybody else and have the capacities necessary to safeguard our interests. Okay, got it. Maybe this kind of falls into that bucket, which is it's not real clear yet, but as they get closer, it'll get clear. Um, yeah, okay. Thank you. I think there's probably a lot of questions. I did want to just go, jump back on a, a question that we kind of talked about, but I wanted to get both of your answers, which is, do you believe that if, uh, if Taiwan is not unified with China by 2049, that that is, uh, sorry, let me, let me phrase that question. Um, so if we're talking about 2049 as a potential squishy uh, uh, timeline or hard yes or whatever you want to call, call however you want to call that, um, when we get to 2049 and China assesses that Taiwan is, has not been unified and the trends are not great, would we be seeing, a, would we likely see a major conflict? Simple question, yes or no. <laughs> Likely, likely, oh, likely, not like, likely. I may have misspoke, likely, I didn't, yeah. Well, I am a Marine, so you know, yeah, we kind of like fights, right? So, uh, <laughs> uh, my answer is it's not inevitable. Okay. Yeah, I, uh, I agree, it's not inevitable. You know, it, it, my caveat, my own caveat was, you know, unless there's a, a significant change of condition, right? And, and, and that creates a likelihood is somebody will recognize, somebody will have a falter, somebody will have a problem, somebody will change their mind. Something could happen. It's not inevitable, right? But, uh, but barring that, it is. Likely. <laughs> Up to the audience for uh, any questions you may have. We have two uh, leading experts on uh, Taiwan as well as broadly um, uh, U.S. defense policy and foreign policy. So I'm sure there are many questions. I don't want to hog up the space here. Please go ahead. Intelligence analyst and a former diplomat. I'm always amazed on this topic because there's sort of this magical thinking that somehow uh, Xi Jinping is not going to invade Taiwan. And it really doesn't matter from a policy perspective. You have to prepare for that possibility. And that means that Taiwan needs the capability to sink the invasion fleet. That's 500,000 uh, men on hundreds of boats, and you have to have enough torpedoes and anti-ship missiles and drones to sink that invasion fleet. And that's the only thing that guarantees Taiwan's uh, uh, freedom. So we're not seeing, we're seeing drabs and dribbles of armament go into Taiwan and no Taiwan capability to produce the anti-ship missiles, the drones and the torpedoes. Um, so when do, when do we get clear on this? No matter what your policy choice, you have to prepare. You have to prepare that that invasion fleet's gonna come. Um, so your question is, are we prepared? 
No. Is that your question? My question is, why the magical thinking? Um, so so your, your question is, why do the panelists believe that China won't evade? Or sorry, what is no, the magical the, why thinking? Why the magical thinking that we have any choice but to make sure that Taiwan has the capability to sink the invasion fleet? Okay, thank you. I think uh, no one is saying that on the panel, but let me defer to our ac experts here. Yeah, I, I, I don't think you heard that from either one of us. So I won't speak for Chad, but I certainly have uh, said myself many times and published in my writings um, that it is essential to have the capability uh, to defend Taiwan. And that's partly Taiwan's responsibility, and it is partly ours as well. Um, I think uh, we are taking this problem more seriously than we have in the past. Uh, we, both Taiwan and we have work to do. So uh, I, I, no, nobody has said what you contend that we have said, um, and I have said nothing that I think can be labeled magical thinking. I took magical thinking as a compliment, so thank you. Um, um, yeah, I mean, I, I was very clear that, you know, uh, the risk of conflict is t today and tomorrow, and it mounts every day until you get towards mid-century. Um, and that it's more of a conditions based and not a timelines based. Although, I guess, since we're supposed to debate, I'll push back a little bit and say, you know, it does matter a little bit. Uh, of course, we have to prepare. That's what defense departments do. That's what China's military does. That's what Taiwan's military does. We all prepare. But it kind of matters how you're informed. It, it matters how the IC articulates that. It, it matters how you plan through those. It, it matters what your strategic decision making is. And if you're pinned, uh, to a thought that she is desperately doing this as terms in office or that there's a magical date of 2027 or 2035, that, that changes how you prepare. And, um, and that's just not, in, that's not accurate preparation. I mean, you should always be striving to have the cleanest, best understanding of the conditions. And there are differences in how you would prepare for those, with those features. It's not just a general preparation. One of them is, is if you're preparing for something that doesn't come, then you undermine your own credibility and you're not preparing for perhaps the longer term stuff that might be a worsening, worse condition, so. Great, thank you. Thank you, Dong Huiyu with China Review News Agency of Hong Kong. Um, both of you seems to be agreeing that if Beijing still has the hope of peaceful unification, so the using of the force will not be so imminent. So recently, Beijing released a uh, new integration initiate between Fujian and uh, Taiwan. Do you believe that uh, Beijing still uh, has hope of reunification and keep the pathway of that. Thank you. How do you interpret this initiate? Well, I, I'll start. I think there's a broader context here before I get to talking about the initiative, and that is China's assessment of the balance of power between the United States and China and uh, the broader international situation. And I continue to hear from Chinese that they do see the United States as in decline. Um, and so that is a factor that is in their decision making when they say time and momentum is on the side of Beijing. Um, they might be a little bit less confident about, the, about <clears throat> Chinese power <clears throat> than they were maybe you know, five years ago. Uh, but I still think that they remain confident in their own system, their, their governance system, um, and they think that the trajectory um, is event that eventually they will convince the people of Taiwan that the United States is not a reliable ally, not a reliable partner, um, and induce this sense of psychological despair and, and, and persuade people that life will be better if they integrate with, uh, with mainland China. And I think that's ultimately their strategy. I mean, that's, they're using lots of different forms of coercion to do that. And there are some uh, what you might call positive inducements. And that's where the new integration zone comes in. But from my reading of this proposal, it looks to me like a repackaging of prior initiatives. 
that were made by Beijing to Taiwan to provide uh, preferences to Taiwanese businessmen or students, and they're saying that uh, uh, citizens from Taiwan can buy property. Uh, but to me, this is not too dissimilar from the, what, the 31 initiatives from a few years ago. There have been various iterations of this. Um, but it, it, it says to me, um, in the near term, that Beijing is trying to figure out ways to shape the outcome of Taiwan's elections. So I make that connection. Um, and that in the longer term, yes, they do want to um, convince the people of Taiwan that if there is a connection um, with mainland China, that that will be beneficial for them. And I think that's part of their strategy. And one final point that I'll make is that I know lots of people cite the, the polls in Taiwan about the around 5% of people who now support reunification um, now or at any time in the future and say, how could Beijing have any hope given that, uh, that public opinion poll? And I would say that what I hear from experts in China is that they say, oh, the government in Taiwan is brainwashing its people. You get a different person in power. Uh, op opinions can change. And I'm not saying by any means that that is, is, is accurate. Um, but I'm just saying that their perceptions are different than ours. And we should not conclude what Xi Jinping's assessment is or their judgments um, in, uh, in Beijing about the prospects for unification based on how we interpret those public opinion polls. Um, we have to really try to put ourselves in their shoes and see how they judge the prospects for unification, not our views. Yes, and uh, I'll tease out even more, and Bonnie really hit the, I thought was, maybe I'll characterize it as magical thinking. But, um, not to make light of that, it's important, that's a good question, but it, it, this is really important here, right, which is, I don't understand, uh, I do, first of all, I agree that yes, they have prioritized uh, peaceful unification and largely through incentivizing actions, even as they're adding disincentivizing actions, pretty significant ones, right? Um, but they do continue to characterize the problem as this small coterie of, of leadership in Taipei and, and on Taiwan that is otherwise duped or brainwashed the larger populace. Uh, now, as they said in the 20th Party Congress, they've kind of added to that calculus this kind of U.S. backing and, and, and uh, support to that co coterie, right? Now, it's, not a, it's not a broad based assumption that they make about the, the Taiwan people, despite the polls. And so, this kind of raises an interesting kind of question for policymakers is, okay, well, that's a bad assumption, I think, right? But have they convinced themselves? So is it the policy, make, is, it, is it better for us to try to go and convince them that, no, that, that assumption is really wrong? Uh, because ultimately, if, if it was wrong and it was, they understood it very clearly that it was a broad-based rejection of that and the trajectory was not in their favor, guess what that triggers, right? Not goodness, it triggers bad things to happen. But it, maybe it's a good thing for us to want them to have that bad assumption because it means any of their actions they would undertake would probably fail miserably. Of course, to do so means that there's probably a lot of destruction of things that we don't want to have destroyed. So there's really kind of an interesting, uh, as you would say, kind of contradiction in understanding the assumptions about that question, what their prioritization is. And it really does beg a question of, do they still believe that the Taiwan populace at some point is willing to come back or they're just brainwashed so they can be re-brainwashed, I guess. Um, and, if, and if they don't believe that, why are they masking that, right? Um, maybe it's because they don't want to go now and that would be a, a rationale that dri would drive them to go now and they're just not ready now. So it's a very interesting thing. It's a very tricky piece of this, of this calculus. Thank you. Uh, let me turn to Brian for uh, some of the online questions. Yeah, so um, this one comes from Christopher Woody from Insider. Um, sorry, let's see. Um, the question was, what is the disappearance of the Chinese defense minister and the recent replacements in the rocket force? Uh, Bonnie, I think this is directed partly at some of your comments about Xi's confidence in the PLA. You know, what do those disappearances and replacements mean about Xi Jinping's or, or Beijing's thinking on, you know, how the PLA will perform on Taiwan, and, and I would connect that to what does that mean for maybe their timelines? 
Uh, you know, that's a good question. First of all, I don't know that he's technically gone. Sometimes people get sick, and uh, we'll see what happens. Uh, he's technically still on the web page and uh, apparently teed up to host a dinner at the Shangshan Forum at the end of the month. Uh, we'll see who actually shows up. Does not look good. Um, uh, but it, there has been, you know, good writings about the implications of the Rocket Force commanders. I think somebody from the CMCDI was relieved. I think uh, you know, Li Shanfu is missing. Um, uh, there's speculation about his predecessor, Wei Feng He. Um, I think those are certainly problems. It undermines Xi's credibility. There's it calls into questions loyalty. I, I don't really think that quite as much. Um, but here's what I think she is thinking about because of these problems. Um, my officer corps has still got significant problems. They're, we're not making the progress necessary in party discipline, particularly within the military, and that's concerning. I have a two million person army. I'll find another replacement and I'll make sure this one's good perhaps. Um, so I don't think he's concentrating on that. I'll tell you what I do think he's concentrating on. This is based on the record of what you're seeing writings about in the last few months, which is, this seemingly is all tied to uh, military fusion, uh, funding, resourcing, uh, particularly equipment development, and as the, in the Chinese parlance, they talk about strategic management, military governance, and uh, systems contribution, and this whole process of modernizing, right? And so it, it's bad that the personalities and the party is being hit by these, these actors, but what that actually is, what he's probably contemplating is that that is symptomatic of a much bigger problem, which is out of all of the reforms that the PLA has undertaken since 2016, all of them have made headway, faltering or otherwise, but this particular area seems to be having chronic problems of not being able to get organized, to get the systems in, into place properly. Uh, it, it's rife with corruption and it's just not operating at the optimal uh, systemic condition that it's supposed to be or designed to be. Well, that's a really big problem because that doesn't just bear on the loyalty of a couple of actors. This bears on getting the PLA to where they need to be at at their modernization levels, and that's a national goal level problem. So I think that's probably where his head's at, and hopefully that's a, a, a helpful answer. Uh, Chair, just to clarify, so the area that you're saying that PLA has not made headway is facing lots of problems is mill civil fusion. Is that the area? Uh, yeah, the area? it's a connection of you know equipment development, strategic management, um, all the kind of forced development uh, modernization issues and that obviously is linked to other outside of the PLA uh, issue areas like Millsif Fusion. Right? So I would just add that um, I think if um, Li Shangfu is being investigated that it's likely for corruption and we know that there was an uh, essentially an investigation launched for the period that Li Shang Fu was head of the um, uh, equipment um, department, what's it? has got a new name, um, 2017 to 2022. So that was the period that he was there. And I would um, guess that if that is the case, that Xi Jinping would believe that if a senior general is focused perhaps on lining his own pockets, he is not focused on his own priority of one of them being having the capability to invade Taiwan in 2027. So I think Xi Jinping is frustrated with the military and his effort to get rid of corruption. And my guess that is that it extends beyond the military, but of course it has particular salience, something salience in the context uh, of, of the military and Xi Jinping's own goals. Uh, but you know, corruption is endemic. Um, in China. This is really difficult to get rid of. And when you give a particular unit a lot of funding and you have one person in charge of it, the opportunities for corruption are ripe. Um, and I don't know, maybe it's difficult to say no. I haven't had that experience myself. Uh, but uh, I, uh, I can see how um, this could have uh, unfolded. Um, and I have heard rumors that there will be more senior generals who will be investigated uh, for corruption in the coming months. Um, so uh, I don't think it tells us anything about um, a, this specific timeline other than um, by 2027, uh, it's not that far away. Uh, I, as I said earlier, believe that Xi Jinping doesn't have the confidence that his military will be able to seize and control Taiwan at an acceptable cost. 
I want to go back to more questions in the room. So one over there. Hi, thank you so much. Um, I'm Liz Tracy. I'm a graduate student at Johns Hopkins SICE. Um, my question is, um, Bonnie, you mentioned the upcoming election. And this sort of issue, seems like you're both saying, has a lot to do with external conditions. And I'm curious how you see a DP, DPP victory in the upcoming election, which is certainly possible as changing Beijing's uh, calculations. I think that Beijing is fully prepared for the possibility of a DPP victory. Um, they're looking at the polls. Um, and uh, I, my own view is that unless there are two other candidates that combine on one ticket, that it's it's almost a certainty that Lai Qingdo will win. Um, I am pretty clear about how the Chinese assess Lai Qingdo. Um, they certainly see him as more pro-independence than uh, Tsai Ing-wen. Uh, and so they are undoubtedly preparing a menu of things uh, that they could do. Um, uh, are they going to do that perhaps if he wins um, at the time of the election? Um, or maybe do they wait to see what he says in his inaugural address? Or, or do they do what they did when Chen shui was elected, which was, um, you know, Qing Qi and Guan Qi Xing will listen to what he, uh, what he does and, and, and we listen to what he says and watch what he does. Um, or, you know, Tsai Ing-wen got the unfinished exam paper, but they gave both of them some time. Um, my guess is no. So my guess is they're right out of the box are going to be much tougher, signaling um, that they have very real red lines that should not be crossed. And those are signals that I think that the Chinese are going to be sending to him as well as to the United States. As we have heard Xi Jinping tell um, uh, President Biden, and this has been reported in their readouts, I don't have the words you know, verbatim, but you know, this is the reddest of red lines that cannot be crossed. Um, so they are really trying to signal resolve, and I think that they won't probably be as patient with Lai Qingda as they have with prior DPP presidents. Chad, do you want to weigh in here? And uh, particularly if China is preparing a menu of options, what, what, what do you think might be on those potential options, particularly on the military side? Yeah, I, I can't really add anything to what Bonnie says. She's uh, much deeper in this area than I am. Um, uh, so I'll, I'll avoid my gut instinct to just speculate wildly for uh, the no end. Um, yeah, the military piece, it, this kind of connects to the previous question, which is how much trust does she have in his military? And certainly there's got to be some doubt and some problems. But there's one kind of interesting point that I'll raise about that, which is, you know, since the Pelosi visit apparently triggered in China's eyes, a pretty significant military response, and then subsequent events have done so. And China right now remains at a very high level of provocation and aggressive and very assertive behavior around Taiwan. Well, you know, she selected those choices, right? Those choices are extremely provocative, very risk-inducing. That's not something that a, a leader who doesn't have trust in his forces to maintain uh, some discipline undertake, right? if he had such little trust in them to be able to do this effectively, to do this safely, uh, to control escalation, as the Chinese term of ours, this kind of effective control of the situation, is if they couldn't effectively control that, you don't allow your forces to undertake those things. You employ them properly. And so the fact that he has, he didn't choose the low-end options, he chose high-end options, highly risk-inducing, highly, frankly, dangerous. And he's continued to sustain that, even through the most recent re reliefs of some of the the PLAF officers, Li Shengfu, and others, right? And as it relates to this question, is that probably won't change in the condition as it's going up. Um, I think Bonnie also answered this in a way that I think is really important, which is it's not their behavior towards uh, the election is, is increasingly going to be an element of how the U.S.-China relationship is formed, right? So recall that the number one problem, the heartache of the Chinese when they talk to us about the events around Taiwan now, Taiwan bears on them because it's a national, it's, it's an interest for them, right? It's a unification of the goal. But the number one thing that they say to us is not that it's a problem because they're not going to unify. It's a problem of what we're doing, as they say, because it undermines the foundations of the bilateral relationship, right? Not because it's a problem of unification. And so 
the, the, the significance of what military action they might undertake as a result here might be more directed towards that problem rather than anything to do with the ta new Taiwan leadership. So. Okay, thank you. Let me collect uh, two more questions from the room. Oh, there's a lot more. Okay. Let me collect the rest of the questions, and then we'll allow these speakers to pick and choose which question they will on. And please keep your question short and a question, please. So let's start from this end. Thank you. Uh, my name is Matthew Potlock. I'm an analyst at the Advanced Tactical Support Group. Uh, my question is kind of similar uh, to digressing to what's happening in Ukraine, the uh, effect that pressure from leadership has had on Russia's, uh, Russia's uh, military action in Ukraine. Um, does Xi Jinping experience or has he experienced pressure from his party to accelerate his timeline? in uh, Taiwan, and if so, how has he dealt with that pressure? Uh, that might also include public pressure or media pressure. So pressure to accelerate timeline because of Ukraine? No, uh, to accelerate his timeline for reunif reunification with Taiwan from more hardline voices within the party. Thank you so much for doing this. My name is Andrew Thornbrook. I'm a national security correspondent for the Epoch Times. I actually, you both raised this very interesting contrast about how the CCP needs to continue to believe peaceful unification is possible to prevent conflict, and that they also believe that a lot of polling on the issue in Taiwan is flawed. I wanted to kind of push you on the subject and ask from a US policy standpoint, should the US seek to encourage the belief among CCP leadership that peaceful unification is possible, even if we don't believe it is, to prevent conflict. Thanks. Uh, Tom Parker, GW University. Would the panelists care to comment on how the, uh, a significant use of military force by China would impact their economic situation, and is it, uh, would it be a significant deterrent? To, towards uh, for the use of military force. Okay, I'm just gonna like two more questions <laughs> up here, and then I thought I saw somewhere. Oh, right there. Yes. Uh. Hi, I'm Mike Fonte. I'm the director of the DPP's office here in Washington. Thanks for a great panel. I want to talk about wiggle room. I think there's wiggle room in the DPP position, in vis-a-vis -vis China. The situation that Lai Qingda has repeated is the same as Tsai Ing-wen. Mike, question, please. Yeah. Okay, I'm going to ask them if they think there's wiggle room. Okay, that's the question. Because I think the DPP position is that if you want to change the current status quo, people of Taiwan have to agree. That's where I think there's wiggle room. And I think if the Chinese use more honey than vinegar, they might find a, find a way forward. Thank you. Last question over there. Hi, my name is uh, Greg Graff. I have a question. Um, if it's true that um, Beijing or Xi Jinping would make the decision to use force if they believe that they face the permanent loss of Taiwan, um, what is your guys' assessment of China's ability, the information system's ability to actually reflect true information, to not provide biased information, to make that decision of whether they're facing the, a permanent loss of Taiwan or not? you know, accurately and truthfully, or would, it, would they kind of reason themselves into that? What's your, th what's your thought on that? Great, two minutes each. All right, I'm gonna pick and choose and apologize to people whose uh, questions I am not um, answering. Um, so uh, I do not see increased pressure to accelerate uh, the timeline. That doesn't mean, of course, it doesn't exist. I have not seen it. Um, and if you ask the question specifically about the public, I would say there is ample evidence that, that the Chinese Communist Party has the ability to control um, the public. They can turn it up, they can turn it down, they have more capability today than they have ever had before. Um, uh, secondly, should we encourage the PRC to believe that peaceful resolution is possible. So I said 
pretty clearly, happy to repeat it, that it is in our interest for the United States and Taiwan to leave the door open, to not signal that, uh, that uh, peaceful unification is impossible. And in prior administrations, uh, the United States has said that we would support any outcome that is peacefully negotiated between the same side, between the two sides of the strait. Sometimes we have said with the assent only of the people of Taiwan, and sometimes under the, it was under the Bush administration, we said un, with the assent of people on both sides of the strait. But setting that aside, we have said we would accept any outcome that's peacefully negotiated. We haven't said we'll accept reunification, but that should be included. It's an outcome. This administration has not made that statement. Um, and I think that's problematic, and I have said that repeatedly, and I have encouraged people in the administration to say it. It is part of our One China policy. We have a series of statements. We don't support Taiwan independence is also one of those statements. Um, we oppose unilateral change in the, uh, by either side in the status quo. So there's a lot that would be said. Um, and then I'll just comment on what you said, Mike um, uh, Fonte. I think Lai Qingde has made a series of important statements um, uh, that uh, I think the Biden-Harris uh, administration has found reassuring. Uh, and, and he has, uh, some of it is in um, uh, statements he has said privately, things that he has said, in the, like the Wall Street Journal article uh, that, was, that was published. Um, and he has said that he will inherit um, uh, Tsai Ing-wen's policy of preserving relations, uh, the, peace, the status quo across the, the Taiwan Strait. So ultimately, there's, there's a set of statements that I think the, that the United States finds reassuring. There are other things he, say, he has said that are a little bit less reassuring. Um, and the most important thing is what actions, if he is elected, um, that he will take. Um, uh, so I, I, I think uh, because the Chinese are going to be putting him under a microscope, as they do any president of Taiwan, um, you know, he has to be um, uh, consistent, you know, in what he says and have actions that really match his deeds. Um, there's no reason to believe that won't happen. Um, but I think that it, it, if, if it doesn't happen, um, we're going to be in for a really rough ride. I'll try to be uh, very brief, but uh, the Ukraine pressure on China, that, that's interesting. There's certainly been some studies. I, I like paying attention to that. Um, I agree with Bonnie is that it certainly has not accelerated the timeline issue or conditions issue necessarily. Uh, in fact, it seems to have actually made them pause because things didn't turn out the way they had anticipated, uh, clearly. Um, but it certainly has accelerated modern. When they attack, it's complete failure, chaos. Uh, the Chinese fail, and then they swim home by themselves, sad. And <clears throat> uh, But the truth, that's utter malpractice as an element of statecraft, is you always would want to avoid anything that would harm anybody, uh, any side, really, right? You don't, bringing about chaos is never probably a good policy. And, and so, but how do you communicate that to the Chinese? And is there danger in, in, in doing so, right? So if I convince them that that is, that is not valid long term, does that, in fact, incite China to then uh, have really what's left is the restraint, right? Uh, it would be a mandatory requirement to go. So that's a tricky kind of question to answer or to discuss, and I, I think that it's kind of more, uh, more talks with the Chinese about, perhaps. Uh, more like intellectual discussions, I think, right? Uh, wiggle room in the DPP, I have, I have no answer. Bonnie is much more sharp on that than I have. Uh, assessing Taiwan or U.S. policy uh, makers is, is, to me, is so unbelievably difficult. I think China is a little bit more matter of fact, so um, I feel sad for people who have to do that. Um, China's assessment of permanent loss, I'd say, do I feel like they would have a clear picture? Oh, that's a good question. Um, yes, generally, I think that they do. Um, you see the latest reactions is certainly they've reached some calculus that it's a, not a bearable condition. You know, their forbearance has limits, as they say, and that they've undertaken actions to demonstrate their dissatisfaction and try to change the trajectory or the trend line, uh, so to speak. Um, but some are easier than others. You know, Chen Shui-bian and the, the political leadership who had promoted uh, referendums back in the Chen Shui-bian uh, period 
uh, very distinct and easy to see something that was very dissatisfactory to the, uh, to the PRC, to China, to the party. Um, some others might be harder to calculate, such as how much U.S. arms sales and training is going on, at what point is one too many boots on the ground. I mean, that those are harder things to calculate. Can they see those and calculate those effectively? I think they, I think they tend to see them pretty clearly. Not all of them are the same algebra problem or algorithmic problem, I guess. Right? Great, thank you, Chad. We uh, and thank you, Bonnie. We have gone a little bit over, and I know we're we're between you and lunch. But please, we do take a minute to do our poll. Um, we do want to see if your thoughts changed uh, since listening to uh, two panelists who both argue against the first the proposition. So we should be expecting the uh, at least the la later two latter two choices to change. And then as we're polling, uh, we'll be on break. So we will start, uh, so lunch is already out there. Um, we will start back at uh, 1.30. Yeah. Well, I went from, let's see, 16% to 42%. I think that's pretty good. So I know it's still loading, and we'll give it another minute, but I did want to take the time to thank our two experts, uh, Bonnie and Chad.